All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's do this. Tonight, we are gonna be talking about Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. I have right here my fresh copy of the alternate cover. We're going to be doing a flip through and commentary of it. Um, literally, we're gonna spend about three hours flipping through this thing. Um, it's not a very thick book, so I think we're probably gonna get through most of it. I have not really read much of it before, so this is going to be a combination of me reading it and learning what it says, and also commenting on it, giving you my thoughts and opinions on things. So that is what is on the plate for tonight. And I'm gonna flip, we have a schedule. We have a, we have a wonderful little schedule here that we're gonna be following. There are essentially four chapters to this book. There is uh, Dungeon Master's Tools, Group Patrons, Character Options, and Magical Miscellany. Now, I will not be going through the book in chronological order. I am going to first touch on the Dungeon Master's Tools, and I have timestamps here. We have, we have roughly a certain amount of time to cover each topic to make sure we get through most of all of the book in three hours. So we're gonna hit Dungeon Master Tools first, and then I'm gonna hit the Group Patrons chapter. Then we're gonna hit Character Options, the very first part of the book, which is most just player options, basically. And then we're gonna hit chapter three, Mis Magical Miscellany, which is also mostly player options. I mean, Dungeon Masters could probably use the spells too, but mostly, ma well, ma I'm sorry, Magic Items is for Dungeon Masters. So anyway, this is the schedule for tonight. Now, if you are watching this on uh, YouTube, uh, then there will be a table of contents down below in the description or in the pinned content, pinned comment so you can easily and quickly get to the parts that most interest you. And we're gonna start with chapter four, which is on page 139. All right, so, well, I mean, <clears throat> this is the alternate cover, and <clears throat> I'm gonna be perfectly honest here, I think this is probably my least favorite of all of the alternate covers that I have seen yet. Um, yeah, not me personally. This is, I'm not terribly impressed by this. I think this is uh, nothing, nothing, uh, nothing spectacular here for me personally. I think the other alternate covers are so, so, so much better than this one. Um, so whatever, that's a, it's personal taste, personal preference. I understand that. So. It's just my take on it. I'm sure there's somebody who's going to be like, Luke, that's the best one yet. And that's fair. It's just a, this is a personal opinion stuff. You know what I'm saying? But I like the other. It's just a totally different style. I like the other ones better. Bottom line for me personally. Is it better than the standard cover? Yeah, it probably is just because it's different, but it does not compare at all to um, their other alternate covers. So I'm still happy to get the alternate cover because I want the alternate covers. I'm just saying it's not my personal favorite at all. Probably, pro probably like my, it's probably at the very bottom. There are so many other better alternate covers. And it's probably, this, I keep trying to drink a coffee while I'm talking. It's probably the style too. It's just not, there's nothing special about it. It's just like, okay, okay, you, you have a color. You have a color, that's great. It has a different color to it, spectacular. And you have artwork, but the artwork is like pretty much kind of the same as the other artwork you'd have on a, a color. Really, the only distinguishing thing about the alternate col cover is the color. It's this, I don't even know what color this col color is. I, I don't know how to call it, what the name of it is. It's really the only distinguishing factor is it's a different color. It doesn't have like a distinctive art style or anything going on. It's just kind of like, okay, cool. It's different art, that's great. And, and a different color, yay, good job. So anyway, yeah, whatever. It is what it is. Probably don't need to spend too much more time on that. We have a table of contents. We're not gonna spend too much time here. We're, we're going to chapter four first, Dungeon Master Tools. That's where I was trying to go. And then I got, I was like, I should probably comment on the alternate cover. So we're going to page 139. Beige? Okay, cool. Beige. Let's go with beige. Thank you. I'm a guy. Guys are known for not knowing colors super well. Unless I Google it. <laughs> All right. Chapter four, Dungeon Master Tools. The first thing we got going on here is session zero. 
Uh, apparently, apparently, after how many years have we had fifth edition? How many years have we had fifth edition? Um, Wizards has decided that they should talk about the session zero. Uh, okay, cool. Let's do it. Before making characters or playing the game, the dungeon master can run a special session colloquially called session zero. Why is it colloquially called that? Like, isn't that just what everybody calls it? Is it a colloquial thing? Is it colloquial? Is it actually colloquial? It's typically called a session zero. I'm sorry. I'm like splitting hairs on wording. I'm a writer. And so I, this is the type of thing that like comes into my mind. I'm like, really? Is that the proper use of that word? Okay. Anyway. Um, I gotta, I gotta move that out of the way a little bit. Okay, often a session zero includes building characters together. As the DM, you can help players during. Yep, that's true. Okay. So the session zero is to establish expectations, outline the terms of a social contract, and share house rules. Making and sticking to these rules can help ensure that the game is a fun experience. Yep, I agree. That's good use of a session zero. That's good advice. Um, character and party creation, party formation. Okay, this is interesting. Let's let's see what they say here. Here are some questions you can ask players as they create characters to get a sense of the party's relationships. Are any of the characters related to each other? What keeps the characters together as a party? That's very important, actually. That is one of the two main questions I have all of my characters answer, all my players answer when they're creating characters. Why are you adventuring together? Why are you staying together? Do not come to my table with an edgy lone ranger, edge lord who's like, I don't like social stuff. I'm going off on my own. That's horse crap. It's a group game. So that's a good question. What does each character like? What does each character like most about every other member of the adventuring party? I'm sorry, that seems a little dumb. <laughs> All right, everybody, let's go around the table and uh, share the thing that we like most about each other. That's like a, one of those team building activities I have to do at work. Sorry. It's probably useful. This is just Luke's, I don't know, malformed attitude i don't know you can call it what you want does the group have a patron now this is this is very you guys this is this is huge um patrons are awesome they were introduced in the eberron campaign setting um and they're beautiful and this has patrons in it we're not talking about that now that will be the next main section we talk about but patrons are amazing and we'll get to that all right where the what's the party's origin i'm not necessarily going to read everything i'm just kind of going through it you know what i'm saying Running a game for one player. Okay, so there is there is some small suggestions about running a game for one player. All right, I could write I could write several pages on that, but you know whatever. Um, a sidekick. Okay, give him a sidekick. Cool. And yeah, there's some information about sidekicks in here, which we're gonna get into too. The social contract. All right. This is I want I wonder what they have to say here. D&D is first and by the way, you guys, by the way, I went to a game once I was I we raided a stream once where people part of their social contract was if they were OK with a situation, they held up cards the entire time a situation was happening. That's like the backwards way to do it. You should hold up a card if you're not OK with the situation. If you're not OK with something happening at the game table, you should raise a flag. Don't hold a bright yellow card up to your forehead for 20 minutes as a scene is being enacted, okay? That is absolutely stupid. Please don't do that. <laughs> it was so silly. I was laughing my butt off when we raided those folks. Wow. Okay, anyway, sorry, that was a tangent. If one or more participants aren't having fun, the game won't last long. Session zero is the perfect time for you and the players to just, you know what I'm gonna do here? Hold on a second. Is it, tell me if this is annoying. I have a laser pointer. Will that be annoying? That's gonna be annoying. What I'm trying to do is point at what I'm talking about so you kind of know where I am, but I don't want to obscure too much of the text in case you're trying to look at it too. Session zero is a perfect time for you and the players to discuss the experience they're hoping for, as well as topics, themes, and behavior they deem appropriate. Inappropriate. Out of this session, a social contract. Yep. I mean, that, those are good things to talk about. Like, if you don't want, for instance, sexual content and stuff to be in your game, that's a good thing to establish ahead of time. Um. If if certain scenes like rape and crap should be off limits, like I, I feel like we shouldn't even have to talk about that. But apparently you do, because sometimes people, dungeon masters will think that it's OK 
to just out of the blue do stuff like that. And yeah, that's not OK. And then sometimes instead of apologizing, they blame the pro that they didn't have a social contract. Instead, sometimes people screw up and instead of admitting that they have a problem and they did something that's wrong and apologizing, instead of just owning it and apologizing, they blame the fact that they didn't have a social contract. I think that's stupid. That is such a horse crap cop out. Some of you might know what I'm talking about. I'm going to mention names, but anyway, let's keep going. <laughs> this is the commentary you get. <laughs> You will respect the players by running a game that is fun, fair, and tailored for them. You will allow every player to... I mean, I, I'm, I agree with that, yeah. I, I I feel like, for the most part, a lot of the stuff that I just read and I agree with, I'll just leave it at that. Um, we'll see how it goes. You will allow every player to contribute to the ongoing story and give every player moments to shine. When a player is talking, you're... I mean, I feel like this is good, solid advice. Um, It doesn't tell you what that means, obviously. Because there, this is like the high level, you know, two thousand feet view. It doesn't tell you what that means in practicality, right? Um, but that's that's accurate high level advice. The players will respect you and the effort it takes to create a fun game for everyone. This is important. I feel like there, I hear stories of groups whose players don't do this, and yeah, that's not cool. The players will allow you to direct the campaign, arbitrate the rules, and settle arguments. I mean, I agree with that. When you are talking, the players are listening. I feel like it's a collaborative effort. Um, I, I wouldn't want the dungeon master to be like the only one running the show and not listening to players, right? But I, overall, I agree with that. The players will respect one another, listen to one another, support one another, and do their utmost to preserve the cohesion of the adventuring party. I mean, yes. Okay, we can summarize some of these rules by be a decent human being, in all honesty. It's kind of unfortunate that like we have to spell it out because people don't understand what that means anymore sometimes. But anyway, should you or a player disrespect each other or violate social contracts in some other way, the group may dismiss that person from the table. Sure. Yeah, there's that's always a possibility getting kicked out of a group because you're a jerk. Yeah. OK, hard and soft limits. This is interesting. A soft limit is a threshold that one should think twice about crossing and is likely to create genuine anxiety, fear, and discomfort. A hard limit is a threshold that should never be crossed. Okay, that's fair. If you want to establish those, okay. Um, well, this is interesting. Common in-game limits include, but are not limited to, themes of scenes of sex, exploitation, racial profiling, slavery, violence toward children and animals. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> gratuitous swearing and intraparty romance um those are in-game limits okay so in-game you shouldn't do those things all right um common out of game limits include unwanted physical contact dice sharing dice sharing holy crap stop the presses do not touch my dice like, I don't care if you touch my dice. Like, really? You're wasting words on dice touching? Like, what do, is, does this mean something that I'm unaware of? Does this Is this referencing something that I'm unaware of? Because, hey, you know what? If you want to touch my dice, like, if you need to borrow some dice, I'll give you some dice, you know? Yeah. Luke, they have children murder in their modules. It's okay for children to murder adults, but not okay for adults to murder children. Dan. Yeah. <laughs> Personally, if you touch my dice, I will cut you. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, yeah, that's kind of stupid. Dice throwing? What about food throwing? Can I throw hamburgers? Can I throw hamburgers and fry? Pizza. Can I throw pizza at you? Is that okay? <clears throat> Shouting, vulgarity, rules lawyering, distracting use of cell phones, and generally disrespectful behavior. Disrespectful behavior. I feel like I'm exhibiting some of that right now. I I, I do apologize. <laughs> don't throw my dice. I am gonna. Don't share my dice. Oh man, I'm so gonna reference this. This is page 141 of Tasha's. Don't touch other people's dice. Okay, that is grounds for dismissal from the game. All right, that's awesome. <laughs> okay, cool. 
I mean, this is good. I mean, this, if you need, it's not a bad idea to talk about these things. You know what I mean? I'm joking about some of it, but you know, it's, it's, it's a good idea to talk about these things. In all honesty, I've never had these conversations with my group. I just use common sense and I act like a good human being, you know, and it hasn't gotten me in trouble so far. Um, but, and, and Theta Tag, you can attest to the fact that, um, how many canines have been killed in our game? You know, it's like you get there are blink dogs. You, you literally have animals in the monster manual. Of course, they're going to get harmed. It's like, OK, so so check this out. Violence toward animals. There are animals in the monster manual. What do you want us to do? OK, I mean, I, I think I know what they're saying. They're probably talking about like gratuitous violence. I, I I think I know what they're talking about and I agree with that. I'm just kind of exaggerating to make a point. <laughs> All right, anyway, let's keep moving. Game customization. In addition to shaping the game around the characters in the adventuring party, You should be prepared to customize the game to suit your player's taste. Yep, absolutely. That's that is Dungeon Mastering 101. That's like what you should have had in the original Dungeon Master Guide. House rules. OK, cool. House rules. How much? OK, that's great. We'll just not too interested in that. Thank you. Thank you for. Well, you know what? You know what that was? This is what this was, you guys. When you're doing layout for a book like this, you don't want to have any white space. You don't want to have any dead space. So they needed to, like, fill up a couple paragraphs or something. I don't know. All right. <clears throat> sidekicks. Okay, this is actually going to be cool. Let's let's see how the sidekick system works. It should be fun. Thirty minutes in. How worthwhile is the book so far? Useless. So far, I've found nothing of tr tremendous value. <clears throat> Good advice, but it's it's yeah. Okay, let's keep going. Sidekicks. Tasha has a little note for us. My soon to be sidekick could learn a thing or two from all this. More material for Project Humpelkanen. Thank you, Tasha, for that wonderful advice. OK, so basically the idea of a sidekick is it is a straightforward way to add a special NPC called a sidekick to a group of adventurers. These rules take a creature with a low challenge rating and give it levels in one of three simple classes. Expert, Spellcaster, or Warrior. Okay, so this sounds to me like a system that you can create um, a hireling or an NPC who is going to adventure with the party. So if you, if you need to flesh out, if you have two players and you need somebody to travel with them or something, you could design a sidekick or something. That's what this sounds like. Or your players might each have a sidekick that goes with them or something. I don't know. It sounds like what it is, which is which is actually a very useful thing, in all honesty. Um, probably something that lots of groups could benefit from. It's just uh, we'll see how they implement it. OK, if, OK, who cares? Different ways of creating it and joining the party. Who cares? That's all whatever. Gaining a sidekick class when you create a sidekick. Oh, I got it. When you create a sidekick, you choose the class it'll have for the rest of his career. It's an expert, a spellcaster, or a warrior. Okay, so an expert I'm imagining is something like a, a sage who will research things for you. Uh, spellcaster and warrior, you have a you have a spellcaster and you have a warrior. It's just two basic classes. Because you don't want to have too much complexity. I, I mean, somebody could argue and say, well, that's just, you should be able to do it. It's like when you want an NPC, a simple NPC that you can travel with the group and the dungeon master has to deal with leveling it up and you, know, you don't want too much complexity. If you if you want a sidekick that's super complex, just have them roll up a new PC. Just roll, use the rules for creating a PC. So hopefully this is a streamlined rule system. It's what it sounds like to me. The starting level of a sidekick is the same as the average level of the group. OK. Got it. Leveling up a sidekick. Whenever the group levels, the sidekick levels. Got it. Hit points. When Whenever the sidekick gains a level, it gains one hit die. Okay, that's great. So, okay. Proficiency bonus. Got it. It's in the table. Okay, there's a table. Proficiency bonuses in it. Excellent. 
ability score increases. Uh, the stat block, uh, again, these t it has these tables. These tables will tell us when they get a proficiency bonus, when they get different features and stuff. So it looks, it, it operates just like a PC class would, it looks like. The same sort of rule system. Um, you just really have basic classes. You have an expert. The expert is a master of certain tasks or knowledge, favoring cunning over brawn. It might be a scout, a musician, a librarian, a clever street kid, a wily merchant, or a burglar. Okay, excuse me, I gotta move my chair. We have cats all underneath me, and I need to get my chair a little bit closer to my desk. There we go, that's better. To, to gain the expert class, a creature must have at least one language in its stat block. You have to be able to talk. <laughs> okay, thanks. And let's see. You get proficiency. Uh, cool art. Cool artwork here. That's pretty cool. I like that. You get proficiency bonuses in different things. You get a helpful feature. You can take the help action as a bonus action. Oh, that's really powerful. So the site. So at level one. At level one. The sidekick can grant advantage on an attack roll as a bonus action. So you are always guaranteed to have your rogue. Your rogue will always have advantage on the attack roll or your paladin will or somebody. That is very that is a very powerful feature for for classes that hunt crit, crit, critical hits like rogues and paladins. For crit hunters, this is super powerful. OK, at level one. I mean, you could argue that's the same thing that a familiar could do. Uh, agreed. OK, fair. All right, and it's got some other stuff that it can do as well. I'm not going to read through every little tiny thing because that'll take me forever. Ability score, it's got like different coordinated strike. It gets evasion. Oh, wow. Very powerful ability. Inspiring help, reliable talent. Okay. So it gets some cool stuff. Then you, then you have a spellcaster. I, I mean, we're getting the idea of this, right? We're getting a feel for what this is. And then we have the spellcaster. What kind of spells are they going to be able to get? Okay, so let's just let's just skip over to this chart here because this is going to give us a lot of information about the spellcaster. So you can see right off the bat here that um, so even at level twenty, the spellcaster sidekick is going to be limited to fifth level spells. So they're about roughly half half behind the curve of a normal spellcaster which seems fair to me. They're a sidekick. They're not a full PC. And how do they get the spells, though? OK, so. The sidekick gains the ability to cast spells. Choose the spellcaster's role, a mage, a healer, or a prodigy. The choice determines the spell list and spellcasting ability used by the sidekick. So if they're a mage, they get the wizard spell list, and their ability is intelligence that governs them. Sure, healer. They get the cleric and the druid spell list, and it's wisdom. Prodigy, it's bard and warlock, and, and they get the charisma. Okay, so you can basically click. Okay, that, that, that sounds cool. I like that. Um, spells known. Okay, so they then they just get the, they get the same thing. They get like cantrips known, spells known. So they don't get spell books then. So they don't have spell books like a wizard. They just have a certain number of spells they know. Um, which is actually good because it streamlines the system and it makes it easier to run a sidekick, so I kind of like that. Um, the, wiz the, the wizard, the mage, is essentially a sorcerer, sorcerer because of what I just said. There is no there is no spell book. You just have spells known. So the wizard is essentially a sorcerer, only it, it has the same mechanics, except that it's intelligence instead of charisma, which is irrelevant. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, it, it works the same way. All right. I think I think that's cool. I like that. So here's the other thing, too. You never you're never really going to know if these are good or bad until you actually use them in a game. <laughs> that's the that's the honest, hard truth of it. Um, so all of my comments right here are just based upon my personal preferences and my experience as a dungeon master. But you don't really know 
if it's really good or bad and see so you use it in a game. And that's probably going to be true for all of the rules we talk about tonight. <laughs> okay, warrior. Um, okay, so the warrior, you get to you get to decide if they're an attacker or a defender. And the defender can use this reaction to impose disadvantage on the attack roll. Okay, so they have like that. Um, that Yeah, yeah, that's cool. I like that. That's very useful. They get second win. They get an improved critical. Okay, that's cool. They get extra attack. Battle readiness. They have advantage on initiative rolls. Okay, cool. Indomitable. So this really sounds like a fighter champion for the most part. And then we got this guy right here. I mean, it's not as powerful as it, obviously, but it kind of has that same feel to it, you know. And we have the warrior. Uh, proficiency bonus. Um, they get ability score improvements. They, oh, this is interesting. Can, can sidekicks get feats or not? I wonder if it actually addresses that. Okay, here we go. Let's see. Whenever the psychic gains the ability score improvement feature, adjust anything at stab block. It doesn't say. It doesn't actually say because usually whenever there's an ASI increase, a PC can get a feat if dungeon masters allow them and most do. Some dungeon masters even give free feats at level one. Yeah, good call. Sorry. Sorry if that's you. Sorry if I just offended you. <laughs> um. Anyway. I, I will put forth that it's probably not a good idea to have sidekicks with feats um, because it's just going to complicate running them at the game table. You're going to take something that is presumably supposed to be a little bit streamlined to not have a full blown police PC. And once you start giving them feats, it's going to get more and more complicated. Obviously, feats are powerful, too, um, but I, I feel like that suggestion is based more on complexity and ease of running them at the game table than getting them too powerful or not. OK, we're back to the warrior. OK, cool. Um, war warrior sounds cool. I like it. So far, I think the sidekick system is really good. Wait, did I miss somebody? No, that's it. That's it. So we have. Yeah, we have the expert, the spellcaster and then the warrior. So I, I think that's good. I had no real qualms there just reading that over. Quaslims, what's up, man? No free feats for me? Why not, man? Isn't that cool? How do you think it compares to interns in Acquisitions Incorporated? Well, here's the thing, Theta Tag. Acquisitions Incorporated gives me zero guidelines on how to create an intern. Like, the Theta, the, the, the intern that you have in your game with me I created the stat block. I created everything about that intern. Like, I got no guidelines in the Ag Inc. book of how to create the actual stat block for that intern. Nothing. Nothing. It was void of advice. I actually feel like I probably, probably <laughs> will you. This is actually, I'm glad you brought this up, Sean. I will probably start using the sidekick system for interns in Acquisitions Incorporated because this streamlines it, it, it I, I kind of like this. This this feels really good to me. I'm going to I'm going to try that. I'm going to see how that works. That's a, and that's a good way to test out uh, the sidekick system as well. I like that. It's good. <laughs> Make a talking character, the wizard from your skit. Read a part of the book in that voice. OK. All right. Here we go. I'm not really paying attention to redemptions, by the way. So you're 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 fortunate that I saw that. If you do redeem something and I don't do it for you, I'll I'll refund your points at the end of the stream. Don't so don't worry about that. I, I'm not gonna steal your points from you. <clears throat> All right, let us see what we have here. Parlaying with monsters. Why fight if a lively chat is possible? If things get out of hand, just show yourself out with a dimension door. Tasha. As a wizard, let me tell you that Tasha so far has been quite unimpressive with her little bits of advice. <clears throat> Meeting a monster doesn't have to spark a fight. An offering like food can calm some hostile monsters, and sapient creatures often prefer to talk than draw weapons. 
If adventurers try to parlay with a monster, you may improvise the encounter or use the social interaction rules in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Consider granting the characters advantage on any ability check they make to communicate with the creature if they offer something at once. I, I feel that that is good advice. The Monster's Desires section below suggests things that a creature might like, depending on its type. Okay, so in general, this is very, very solid advice. Like, it will make your game so much better. No idea! You have no idea how unsatisfying and horrendously horrible games are when every single monster or creature you run into immediately draws its weapon and attacks you out of the gate. There's never an opportunity for the players to talk with the monsters. There's never an opportunity for any chit chat, any negotiations, any social ways to get past the encounter. In games like this, you walk into the room, the monsters attack. You walk into the room, the monsters attack. It's always, sometimes you are rolling initiative before you even see monsters. Like, like, <laughs> it's like the dungeon master's like roll initiative and you're like, I don't even see any monsters. Roll initiative. It's like, dude, like, if they got a surprise round on us, just describe the surprise round and then have us roll initiative. Like, that's okay. But like games where you never can talk to monsters, you can never parlay to monsters are just horrible. In my opinion, obviously, but it, it might cater to people who only want to ever fight things. But the dungeon master should ideally give players the option of how they resolve an encounter. So don't have monsters just attack out of the gate. Have the monsters maybe drop their hands to their weapons and look at you. What are you doing here? Who are you? And then the players have to talk. And it's possible the players aren't going to be able to talk their way out of it. And the monsters will draw their weapons and attack. But by giving the players the opportunity to choose how that encounter goes, you are allowing them to have a social interaction, to do some of the talky talky bits. And then if it comes to combat, it comes to combat. Some of the best encounters I have had, the most memorable and exciting and fun ones have been encounters where it was not resolved by combat. It was resolved by some clever role playing or some trickery. And we all laugh about it and we love it and we have fun with those encounters. So, so, heed, heed this bit of advice about parlaying with monsters, please. I am in a game right now where we almost always, my cat's yelling, he's yelling at me. I'm in a game right now where almost every single time we run into a creature, they attack us just out of the gate. And it's just, it is not good gameplay. Bottom line, end of story. Okay, so don't, Dungeon Masters, please don't do that. Be be more creative than that. Be, it's not, it's not, even, it's not even creative, it's not even creative. It's just allowing your players to interact with the situation and not forcing them down the path of combat every single time. Now, sometimes monsters will just attack out of the gate. Yes, it will happen, but it shouldn't be every single time in the entire stinking campaign. I have to stop now. We're going to keep on going. I'm sorry. We're going to continue reviewing this despite my my anger and my unresolved problems. <laughs> All right, anyway, this is good advice, okay. You basically have a bunch of tables here about what monsters want, what their desires are, and stuff like this. These tables might be useful for someone, that's fine. Um, I would probably never use these, I just create this stuff on the fly as I roleplay a creature, because when, part of creating an adventure, part of creating an encounter is knowing as a dungeon master what the creatures want. Why are they there? What are they doing? What are their goals? What are their motivations? And if I know that information, then I can improvise during a during a social interaction between the players, characters and the creatures. So this might that might be useful for someone somewhere. Um, I'm probably not going to use that stuff. I need more real estate on my desk. All right, we are at 
Environmental hazards. Okay. Yay. So this section explores how to add fantastical challenges to any locale and ways to further bring an adventure's setting to life. When a creature... Okay, yeah. Supernatural regions. Not all lands thrive as nature intended. Okay, that's great. So it looks like... It looks like really we just have some random tables or see random tables are useful not not necessarily to roll randomly on them but to read them and to spark your creativity spark your imagination and help you decide on something that you want to put in your game so you don't i i rarely use random tables to roll on them i use them more to find something that i like and that i want to put in my game so you know there's a blessed there's, there's some super supernatural regions and there's some interesting mechanics so i don't know one one character in the region is suffused with celestial power for one minute the character's magical melee it's stop yelling jeez i'm not giving you attention <laughs> my, my cat wants me to pet him you so loud stop now he's rolling on the ground. Th okay, okay, we're gonna have to give him some attention. I'm sorry. Little guy, what is your problem? You are a pain in the butt. Yes. Here, you happy? You happy? Are you gonna be quiet now? Are you going to be quiet? Ugh, okay, he might be satisfied. Sorry. <laughs> I, had, I had to give him something. <laughs> uh, this is cool. Cool art. Um, Far Realm. As souls travel away from the material plane after death, they either enter the astral plane, blah, 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 blah. Some entities find ways to travel beyond the outer planes and dwell in the Far Realm. There they transform over eons into abominations or elder evils. Oh, that's cool. Seething in a reality with its own laws. All who stay in the Far Realm are eventually twisted into alien shapes by the Far Realm's eldritch forces. Yeah, this is cool. And now we're going to have a bunch of information. Um, so consider rolling on the Far Realm effects table when the following circumstances occur in a region touched by the Far Realm. So you can have a region that is touched by the, by the far, far Realm. So maybe the material plane is suffused with energy or something from the Far Realm, I, I don't know. So we have a bunch of interesting things, presumably. Um, the landscape melts into a mass of writhing eye, flesh, eyes, and fanged mouths. From an unoccupied space in the fleshy ground arise 1d4 plus 5 gibbering mouthers that attack anyone in sight. Make sure in your session zero you talk about horror aspects. Okay, this is very horrific. It's d d folks. <clears throat> All right. And, and touching other people's dice. Don't forget to talk about that. I mean, this is cool. I like this. This is cool. Haunted. Okay, the same thing for haunted. If you have a haunted environment, you're going to have some, some suggestions on a table to help you spark, some inf um, spark your creativity about a haunted environment. This is useful. I like this. Um, I would probably use this. Infested. On many worlds, the biomass of insects radically outweighs that of higher organisms. Oh, wow. So, okay, okay, that's cool. So you have an infested city. This is cool artwork. Um, it's, it's, it's moderately cool. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. And then we have a mirror zone. A mirror zone occurs where planar and magical energies converge and create a place of reflections. Creatures, objects, and energy reflect, refract, duplicate, or are transported elsewhere. Such locations arise from blah, 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 blah. Yeah, okay, this is, I mean, sure, it's interesting. This could be useful. Psychic resonance. In an area of psychic resonance, magic imposes strange effects on creatures and objects. These manifestations stem from strong emotions combined with magic use or from the presence of psionic creatures. I'm going to read one of these, too. Thoughts in the region attract ambient psychic energy, 
forming protective fields around creatures' minds. Creatures in the region gain resistance to psychic damage for the next hour. Is everything a benefit? Is everything a benefit? Hold on a second. You can't have everything be a benefit. You gain the ability to cast telekinesis. You have advantage and wisdom insight checks for one hour. Okay, they have difficulty concentrating for one hour. They have disadvantage on some checks. Okay. Um, you get advantage on wisdom perception checks. Hold on a second. I'm about to, I might be ranting in a moment. For one hour, each creature, you gain the ability to communicate telepathically with any other creature. Okay. Lurking fears become nightmares. Um, okay, so a, a very low saving throw or gain no benefit from resting. Okay, that's a bad thing. Um, take some psychic damage. Advantage on stuff. Oh, jeez. Headaches and nosebleed play humanoids in the region posing disadvantage. Um, okay, so I feel like, okay, I, so this is what I was looking for. I saw, I, I thought I was seeing a pattern of only giving positive benefits to the area, but it looks like there's roughly an even, roughly an even balance of bad benefits, which is fair. So you could get some bad stuff or some good stuff. Okay. I like that. Um, I, I was, I thought that they were only going to have good things that would happen to the characters. And then I started, and I was about to rant on that because that, that would be horrible design. Um, but there, it, there are some bad things too. So I, I feel like that's really good. <clears throat> unraveling. So we, so we have unraveling magic. I'm not going to read through every single one of these. We have um, an unraveling magic area. We have a magical phenomena area. Okay, cool. And then it has some some eldritch storms. Flay wind, supernaturally powerful winds, a flame storm, sooty thunderclouds shot through with red and orange lightning. All right. Necrotic tempest, storms infused with the essence of death. All right, cool. Emotional echoes. So, so overall, my impression of this section, and this is the, what was this? The supernatural regions? I think this was the supernatural regions section. Well, this calls it in, yeah, supernatural regions. Okay. So the supernatural regions section, um, overall, my impression is very positive. I think this is really cool. I think this is definitely going to be useful um, for dungeon masters to kind of help them get inspired or come up with interesting and unique places for their players to go and interact with. So I think this is very good. Very, very good. I like this a lot. What is this? Magic mushrooms? What did I just run into? Am I still in the same section? I think so. <laughs> magic mushrooms. Okay, hold on. You guys, we have we have a section about magic mushrooms in Tasha's. I feel like I feel like this is I mean they did you know what you know it's very interesting? In the session zero information, they did not discuss whether drug use was acceptable at the game table or not. So apparently, apparently, according to Wizards of the Coast. It is very important for you to talk about touching people's dice, but, but you should not talk about whether drug use is acceptable or not. <laughs> okay, I guess we know what folks over there. Okay, I should stop talking. <laughs> All right. All right, Luke's, Luke's going to move on from that <laughs> spiral of death right there. <clears throat> Mushrooms can be deadly, delicious, or both. Thank you. Some have magical properties, especially those that grow in areas suffused by mystical energy, such as the Underdark and Feywild. All right. Creatures proficient in medicine, blah, 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 blah. To determine the effects of eating such fungus, roll on this table. Oh, okay, cool. I mean, that's cool. I like, I think that's fun. Primal fruit. Okay, so it sounds like we have fruit. We have fruit that has effects as well. Okay, this is cool. I think this is cool, you guys. This is fun. I think this will be fun. I can I can see including magic mushrooms and some primal fruit in my games and that being pretty fun for my players. So yeah, that's pretty cool. I like that.
Oh, we, that was the that was the magical phenomena section. We so we got into a different section called magical phenomena, and it was very hard for me to tell that I got into a different section because if you notice, like, see how this text for this subsection is red and roughly the same size. Look at the comparison here. It's almost identical, except that this one has an underline there. So that make th for me, that's an organizational problem. Like, it, it, you know, I didn't even know I was going into a different section because the titles are so similar. The, the subtitles and main titles are so similar. So that's I'm definitely going to pick and that's going to be a nitpick for me. That could have been done better. I didn't even know it. I had gone to a different section. OK, but that's cool. I like that. Um, natural hazards. Natural hazards. Even without the threats of supernatural environments, the world is a dangerous place. Thank you, Wizards of the Coast. We are playing Dungeons and Dragons. Everything in this world is potentially dangerous. <laughs> the following. I mean, they're right, and and using this stuff can definitely make your game better. I'm just I'm just being a smart butt, you know what I'm saying? Um, okay, so we got avalanches. Okay, so it sounds like we have game rules for natural hazards. So here are some game rules for avalanches in your game. Falling into water. Okay, what does this say? A creature that falls into water or another liquid can use this reaction to make a check to hit the surface head or feet first. Okay. On a successful check, any damage resulting from the fall is halved. Falling onto a creature. Oh, interesting. So some game rules, specific game rules for falling onto water and onto a creature. Spell equivalents of natural hazards. Oh, this is useful. This is very useful. So a lava bomb, radiation, smoke, St. Elmo's fire. I don't know what that is. <laughs> it sounds like something from the Feywild, maybe? Swamp gas, tidal wave, thunder, volcanic lightning, a whirlpool. It's, I mean, that could be useful. OK, cool. Oh, oh, look at that. We got a page. We got not even one page on natural hazards. OK, so that was an afterthought. All right, fair. <laughs> Do an Elmo voice. I don't even really know. I would have to listen to a video of Elmo speaking. St. Elmo's fire is a type of lightning that orbits solid objects like ships and makes them glow. It's basically fair fire. Oh, interesting. That's interesting. You're upset that he skipped the mimic colony. I mean, I can go back to it. Let's see. Where was that? Where was the mimic colony? Um, hold on. OK, mimic colonies. Let's go back, get this on. Mimics imitate terrain and dungeon dressing to hunt for food. Oh, oh, mim oh, mimic. For some reason, I was thinking a um, myconoid. For some reason, I had myconoid in my brain when I saw this at first and I wasn't putting it together. But mimic, mimic colonies. All right, groups of these creatures band together. Got it, got it, got it. They can communicate with each other. OK, confronting a colony. A mimic colony's primary goal is survival. OK, that's OK, good. If threatened by a force, the mimics can't overcome. They're willing to bargain. Mimic colonies have learned. Why would OK? have learned from it that adventurers they can't defeat can be bought off with information about nearby creatures or locations, hidden treasures, or even one of their own young. <laughs> I mean, that's very true. <laughs> and they can and then they have a stat block for a juvenile mimic. So they could they could give the adventuring party a, a, a one of their own young as an offering. OK, to have to have them leave them alone. Do you guys see that there's something going on here over in the session zero session? There was something about um, violence against young like there, you're in your session zero. You're supposed to talk about whether it's OK to have violence against children um, or against like animals and stuff. And then here, here, here we have simultaneously in the same book, we're being told 
that mimics, which are intelligent creatures, they are intelligent creatures, will give away their young. And adventurers, it's okay for you to steal, take the young child of this creature and basically introduce it into what? A life of slavery? Is that what we're talking about here? So we have parents giving away their children and then adventurers taking them to become servants at best, slaves at worst. And we know exactly what our players would do. Okay, okay. As you see, this is the problem. This is, this is like, this is why. <laughs> okay, thank you. This is wonderful. I mean, I think this is fun. To me, this is fun, okay? But somebody, somebody really needs to put, okay, I gotta stop. I'm gonna like lose my mind over these types of things. All right, we're gonna move on. My point has been made. Thank you, thank you for going, taking us back to the Mimic Colony. That was, that was great. Okay, now we have a, now we have a section on puzzles. <laughs> Oh, Luke, should I be holding a yellow card up right now? Yes, you probably should, which is why I'm moving on. I held my own yellow card up. <laughs> oh, man. The puzzle section is useless and horrible, says someone from chat. OK, well, let's take a look at this. Puzzles. Why create a solvable puzzle? Just pose an enigmatic question without an answer and watch your trespasser squirm. Well, I think we can stop right there. Thank you, Tasha. Are these supposed to be clever? Are these supposed to be clever or something? Who wrote these? Can we get the name of the person who wrote these? I want to write them an email. I don't know. Oh, 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 you know what we did? We forgot to look at? They always they always try to write these clever things. Um, OK, the disclaimer, the disclaimer. I forgot to read the disclaimer. They always have these disclaimers and they try to be clever. Sometimes they're funny and clever. Sometimes they I just roll my eyes. But let's take a look at this disclaimer and see what we have here. Sorry, I, I totally skipped that over. Disclaimer <clears throat> contained herein are the observations of the Archmage Tasha later known as the Witch Queen, and then Igwilov. She is one of the greatest wizards in the history of the multiverse. We fear there is an incantation hidden within these notes and have therefore bound this book with powerful wards. If you were reading this, the first ward has already been broken. If you dare read any further, we cannot guarantee the safety of your soul or that you won't open a portal to another plane of existence. If a portal does appear, pray that nothing worse than Tasha's mother, Baba Yaga, appears. And if the mother of hags arise, be sure to offer only praises of her daughter or offer muffins. She loves muffins. Well, that definitely did not appeal to my sense of humor, but I'm sure some people probably enjoyed that. All right, let's just keep moving on here. I, I like muffins. I love blueberry muffins. You guys, if you ever want to send something to my P.O. box, blueberry muffins. That's the way to go. Like, probably dip them in salt so they are well-preserved. But, yeah, blueberry muffins. Thank you. <laughs> muffins are good. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at puzzles. Here we go. <clears throat> um, Devious traps and multifaceted mysteries might not be staples of fantasy adventures, but they're not the easiest challenges for a dungeon master to present on the fly. This section provides a selection of puzzles designed to invite group participation and challenge adventurers of any stripe from genius scholar. Okay, that's great. All right. Why use puzzles? I almost never use puzzles in my game. I have found from my experience that puzzles appeal to a small subset of players. Um, You can be almost guaranteed that of your five, four or five players, Two or three of them will be like, oh my gosh, can we somebody solve this quickly so we can play the game? And then one of them will take an intense interest in solving the puzzle. Um, so <laughs> they don't appeal to everyone. And if it takes too long, many of your players will be bored out of their minds. That has been my experience as a dungeon master, just speaking from experience. So I do not use puzzles very often for that, primarily for that reason. Also because I don't feel that I'm very good at making them in all honesty. 
All right, why use puzzles? Puzzles provide exciting opportunities. They're not exciting. I have never been in a game with a puzzle that was exciting. Let's just get that out there right now. <clears throat> puzzles provide opportunities to use wit to overcome obstacles and allow characters to collaborate to make discoveries. Well, no, puzzles are not characters collaborating. Puzzles are the players collaborating. It has nothing to do with in-game characters. It has 100% to do with the players using their own intelligence to solve them. Otherwise, I would just have my wizard make an intelligence check and solve the puzzle, and we'd move on in two seconds, and I'd be happier. <laughs> the dungeon master might not, because the dungeon master took an hour to make the puzzle, and I just rolled an intelligence check, and I solved it in two seconds. <laughs> All right. To encourage a party to discover information through teamwork. I've never seen a puzzle scene play out with teamwork. Well, sometimes. Usually it's one or two people that are trying to solve it and the other ones just want it to be over with. I'm sorry, am I being very negative about puzzles? I should probably be, be more chipper about puzzles. <laughs> <coughs> to provide an opportunity for characters to use their skills in uncommon ways. To make a setting feel more whimsical. I'm just, okay. Okay. Okay, whatever. Um, you, you can do all of these things without puzzles, by the way. Every single one of these can be accomplished without the use of a puzzle. Those are not reasons to use puzzles. <laughs> okay. Um, puzzle, puzzle elements. Okay, so... Difficulty. Okay, there's... Okay, they're giving me some basic rules about how puzzles work. Okay, great. Puzzle features, it gives you an overview, there's a solution, there are hint checks. Oh, you give them hints. Oh, okay, we give them hints. Okay, great. Provide one or more of the hints if the players get stuck. Okay, if they totally get stuck, can you just give them the solution to the puzzle? Okay, whatever. I mean, it's 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 not bad advice. I'm just being, like, you know, <laughs> critical. Customizing the puzzle, hints, okay. If players request a hint while attempting to solve a puzzle, As a dungeon master, I would never give players a hint if they asked for a hint. <laughs> I would use my own judgment on whether when they need a hint and when they're they need more time and they just aren't putting forth enough effort or something. I, I don't know. Anyway, that's not the point. <clears throat> Each hint is associated with a skill and a DC. If a character in the party has proficiency in a skill related to a hint, share that hint with them. Okay, so they're going to get a bunch of hints and you reveal the low DCs first. Okay. If, it, if no character has proficiency in any of the listed skills, characters can make ability checks using the listed skills and DCs. Okay. So, can make ability checks. You know how easy it is to make ability checks in a, in a party of five people, unless you enforce limits on who can do it? Eventually, somebody's going to make the check. All right. Unless you house rule something where they can't, where everybody can't roll on it. Running puzzles. Oh, let's see what advice they have for running puzzles. Once you've presented a puzzle to a group, feel free to add and clarify details as you would in any other type of encounter. Try not to give away details of the puzzle solution in your descriptions, but there's nothing wrong with letting a hint slip here or there. Really? You just gave us a whole thing about hints. Of course, there's not anything wrong with it. You just told us to do it. Don't worry whether it's a player or a character who's solving a puzzle. Really? Is that your advice? Because if my character is solving the puzzle, then I'm rolling an intelligence check and it's going to be over very quickly. I feel like puzzles were designed for players to solve them, not characters. <clears throat> While hint checks provide a way for character experience to contribute to a puzzle solution, ultimately the boundaries between a player's and a character's ability to solve a puzzle isn't as important as the group enjoying the challenge. I would agree with that. I, I agree with that. However, if a player knows the answer to a puzzle in advance, urge them to on share only hints their character learns. Okay, that'll never happen. You can just throw that out. <laughs> I'm sorry. After presenting a puzzle, encourage the party to solve it together, to pool hints, and to share their insights. Work with the group to share any puzzle handouts and take turns talking through their thoughts. Ultimately, solving a puzzle will be a victory for the whole group, not one individual. I mean, yeah, it's a victory because the pain and suffering is over. 
and we can go on to other more interesting parts of the game. But that's just because I don't like puzzles. <clears throat> um, I'd rather do almost anything else in the game, <laughs> including listen to the Dungeon Master tell a story. <laughs> okay, that's it. And now I have, and now, and now we have sample puzzles. Okay, we have sample puzzles. This feels unsatisfying. I mean, I don't even, I don't even know if I want to read through this. Each puzzle is a page long. So each puzzle is like an entire page long. <clears throat> it has like an overview, some read aloud text, puzzle features, a solution, some hint checks. Look, look at how low these DCs are. Oh, well, I mean, this is easy. This is supposed to be easy. So, I mean, that makes sense. Okay, that's fair. And then customizing the puzzle. Really? This is an easy one. Skeleton keys. I mean, I'm not going to read through these things. I don't know if these are good puzzles or bad puzzles. I don't I, I really don't want to read one. They're too long. It's going to take me too much time to read through these things. Well, we should read one of them. All right. Or this one has skulls on it. This one has skulls. So let's read the one with skulls. This is this makes it more interesting because I can see skulls, which should actually be part of your session zero talk about whether death should be allowed in the game or not. You know, I need more coffee. Why don't I have more coffee? I need someone to get me coffee so I don't have to get up. All right. This is a medium difficulty puzzle. This puzzle is easily situated in a dungeon, a dusty mausoleum or an abandoned shrine. You enter a dimly lit chamber. Nine dwarf skulls rest near a four foot square set of tiles on the floor and carved into a nearby stone altar is the following inscription. Brave warriors met their demise foretold. Their secret kept shall yet unfold. If crowns placed correctly on the shrine, celestial beds of four for four of nine. Nine dwarf skulls. And then this is so this is it. This is the only, this is my clue. This is my hint. Brave warriors met their demise foretold. Their secret shall kept shall yet unfold. If crowns placed correctly on the shrine, celestial beds of four of nine. So apparently I haven't got all the description I need yet. This doesn't give me enough of anything here. It sounds like I have to put the skulls on the shrine in, in the correct arrangement. Celestial beds for four of nine. So four of the skulls are supposed to go up there, but not all nine of them. So I have to find the correct four and put them up on the shrine. If I find the correct four and put them on the shrine, then I solve the puzzle. This is what I'm guessing. Solving this puzzle requires a secret, causes a secret compartment in the altar to open, revealing treasure hidden within. The compartment can't be opened in any other way. Oh, oh, here we go. Nine dwarf skulls rest near a grid of one foot square tiles as shown in player handout three right here. Oh, wait, see the end of this chapter? Oh, there's a player handout I have to give them? Okay, hold on a second. Where is this player handout? See the end of the chapter. Okay. Player handout. Where is, where is the... Okay, here we go. Okay. So this... What does it say? What does it say? Nine dwarf skulls rest near a grid of one foot square tiles. Okay, so this is literally what the players will see on the ground. The skulls and then a grid. And it has some markings on the grid. Okay, cool. Got it. The numbers labeled each row and column denote how many skulls belong within. Characters must place the skulls so that the correct number of skulls appear both in the rows and columns while still covering four of the stars. Oh, okay. I mean, that makes sense. Gosh. Gosh. Oh, gosh. 
This puzzle has multiple possible solutions with one with one shown in diagram 4 2. Oh my word. Please don't make me do this. Okay. Dwarf characters have advantage on ability checks to gain hints in the room. Okay. So the DC for for a DC 15 intelligence investigation check, the verse indicates to the character that four of the skulls need to rest on tiles engraved with stars. Okay. And then another one says, the one, two, th and three markings around the edge of the grid likely denote how many skulls must be placed in those rows and columns. Those aren't hints. Those give you the answer. Sorry. Sorry for the outburst. The hints literally tell you how to solve the puzzle. At that point, you just have to start rearranging them. Okay. That's not a hint. That's the solution. They should they should relabel that. This is this is how to give your players the solution to the puzzle. <sighs> Gosh, I mean, it's here's the thing. It's not a bad puzzle necessarily, you know, it's like it's a puzzle. You got to figure it out. OK, got it. I just. I just wouldn't want to have to play this in my game. But that's because I don't like puzzles. I, I feel like all I feel like all of my commentary on this section is skewed because I don't like puzzles. So I I'm, I, I really can't give you an unbiased opinion on the puzzle section. I'm, I I do apologize. <laughs> it's not a bad puzzle. I just feel like it would be miserable trying to play through this at a game table. You know what I mean? And and the hints really give you the answer. They give the whole thing away. But it's not a bad puzzle. I'm not going to look at all the rest of them in here. I feel like there are there are, there are, there are about 12. I would say there are about 12 different puzzles in here. Um this is pr honestly this is probably enough puzzles to last you an entire campaign. Like you probably don't need to put any more puzzles in a campaign than what's in this book. Cuz that probably wouldn't be fun. But I, I don't know. It doesn't really give you any guidelines on how to create your own puzzles or anything, which is probably fair because imagine writing rules and guidelines about how to create your own puzzles. I mean, that would be really hard. So, OK, you have some puzzles you could use in your games if you want to. I feel like some dungeon masters and some groups will probably enjoy this depending upon their personal preferences and how much they like puzzles and other groups this might not be very useful for um yeah there you go that's that's what you got all right let us go over and see what is up next um so that was that was the dungeon masters tools which was supposed to take us until 7 p.m. And you will notice that we are almost at 7.30. And I just got through that. <laughs> Whee! <laughs> Hell Jordan says my whole group loves puzzles in D&D, but I hate them. There you go. I mean, some people like them. Yeah. All right. We need to keep moving here. Um, the next thing we're going to look at is group patrons. Group patrons is going to be the next thing we look at. But before we jump into that, um, I'm going to take a bio break. We're going to do a cat strike and I'll show you some of my kitties. Some of them. Hopefully we get, we get a lot of them. We'll see how many we get. I got to take a bio break though. This is the cat strike right here. Oh, squeaky. Yes, Squeaky. Squeaky really wants, really, really wants some of this stuff. They're swarming. They're so swarming. Yeah, yes, I'm working on it. Calm down, man. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Big baby. Morning. 
orange. All right, now while you watch the kitties, I'm gonna go take a bio. You got orange, orange in the box. <laughs> Where's the rest? Where are the rest of our snacks? <laughs> there are no snacks. Okay, let's keep going. So we are we are going to be doing chapter two, group patrons now. Let's see, where is that? Where's the, oh, there it is. Let's go over to that. <clears throat> I'm gonna go to the table of contents, chapter two, 83. Page 83. Get that out of the way. All right, so the first thing that I'm gonna tell you about group patrons, you guys, is these were introduced in uh, the Eberron campaign setting. That's, I mean, at least they're there. I'm assuming they were introduced there and they're amazing. These, the patron system, the group patron system is absolutely amazing and awesome, you guys. Okay, let me just put that out there right now. Um, <laughs> it's, it's so good. I love it so much. So let's take a look at this. Um, each adventuring group is bound together by the quest of blah, 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 blah. This, ch okay, this chapter offers a way to bind your party together, a group patron. These patrons provide a strong, oh wait, hold on a second. This artwork is awesome. This artwork is absolutely amazing. I love this full page illustration. Very, very good. Very, very nice. Oh, look at this. A group of wizards pledges themselves to their patron, Tasha the Witch Queen. This is amazing artwork. Very, very nice. Okay, continue. These patrons provide a strong binding element, an individual organization that unites a party as a team in service to a greater purpose. A group patron can help set the tone of your party's entire campaign. For example, a group whose patron is an academic institution is likely to have a very different story from a group that serves a military. A patron can influence characters' relationships, their backstories, and the types of dangers they face. All right, so how patrons work. This is the nuts and bolts of it. The following section presents several group patron options. The descriptions of these patrons provides an overview of the types of organizations the group 
Patreon presents, perks, membership, and quests that Patreon encourages adventurers to undertake. With the input of your DM, you can customize these patrons. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Having a group patron gives an adventuring group a common purpose, which serves better coordination in the form of guidance, which inspires better coordination in the form of guidance and encouragement. As a result... Okay. I'm going to get encouraged. I'm encouraging you. Okay, thank you. As a... Sorry. As a result of this unity, each member of the party can grant advantage to an ability check, an attack roll, or saving throw of another... What? What? Oh, this is dumb. To gr I'm sorry. <laughs> to to grant advantage in this way, the character must. Okay, they have, okay. Once per long rest. So once per long rest, they can do a thing where they grant advantage. Okay, whatever. That's not. Oh, that's oh, so. Group assistance is is a, is a game mechanic. If you're in, if you have a patron, then group assistance is something that you can do to give each other advantage. Okay, I got you. I'm I'm with you. I understand. I mean that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, I guess. Perks. Okay, you you definitely you get perks for you get perks as being part of a patron. Got it. And then we can look at some examples later. Assignments. So you're going to get some perks and some benefits from the group. You're also going to get assignments. Your group page your group's patron occasionally offers you an assignment, a mission that provides a springboard for adventure. Of course, it's up to you to how to respond to your patron's demands. And interesting stories can result if you decide to refuse an assignment. A more hands-off patron can still significantly motivate your group. Maybe you seek adventurers based on what pleases your patron, possibly earning status and rewards within the organization. Okay, so basically the, the idea here, you guys, and the reason I like this is that if you're running a group, if you're running a game where the adventuring party has a group patron, the patron can basically serve as your, your quest giver. You know, the patron can give them assignments. Or, or now here's the thing, you can play this either tightly or loosely. The patron might give them options to choose from. These are these are several things that you could go do, or it might be more. It, it could be more railroady in the sense that they don't have much of a choice. So I feel like it depends on how you want to run that. My personal preference would be to run this in a way that the players have the choice of which assignments they want to take on. Like the patron could come and say, hey, I have three options. This, this, or this, which one do you, would you guys, you know, it, does one of these interest you? And then, and then they could say, yeah, let's go take this one on. It provides a really cool way to introduce adventures and missions to your group is what I feel about it. Now you could always still have other plot hooks in your game. You could still have different uh, various ways that the adventuring party could find missions and adventures to go on. And they don't all have to come from the patron. I just feel like the idea of having a patron um, is really cool and interesting. And, and it's very similar to Acquisitions Incorporated, which is a style of play that I enjoy as well. And I did an entire video on my channel too, by the way, about Acquisitions Incorporated and how it helps the Game Master in a variety of ways. It helps the Game Master, it solves lots of problems the Game Master often encounters when they're running their games, um, which is, I'm not gonna go into those details now. That's not part of, that's not part of this look through. All I'm telling you, right, all I'm really telling you is that this is really cool. This is an this is an excellent addition to your game. You know, it's a, a tool you can use that's really really cool in my opinion. So, so this is good. All right. <clears throat> so you could be in a, you could be in an academy. So your patron is an academy. And if they're an academy, they're going to have certain motivations and goals and stuff. Here are different types of academies. Um, perks of being in an academy, you get compensation, which is probably nothing. Very little. <laughs> Documentation. Each member of your group has identification denoting which affiliation. Okay. They grant you special status. Okay. Research is part of your group's job. But your patron also has abundant resources to facilitate such efforts. Okay. You have resources, you have access to different resources, libraries, museums, training facilities. OK. All right. And then you so this is so every single patron they're going to outline in this book. I know this because I, I, I read the Eberron campaign setting, but they're basically going to give you a type of patron 
and then they're going to give you the perks that the adventuring party will have if they are part of if they have that patron as their patron. <laughs> and then they're going to give you a contact. This is your NPC quest giver, essentially, that will be at the, the patron. And here we have an academy contact. Um, so there are some different options here. You can have a functionary, a celebrated instructor, a wizened fixture, an infatuated tourist. So there's some different things here. What is this? Academy Factorums? I don't even know what that is. The Academy Factorum rules table provides suggestions for functions you perform within an academy. Oh, so like your role within the academy. Okay, so you could have different roles. A student, a groundskeeper, a professor, a researcher, a financier. Okay. And different quests. And then it's going to give you suggestions for different types of quests that an academy patron might send you on. Okay, this is useful. And then really, it's it's going to be the exact same sort of thing for all the different patrons. So I'm not going to read through every single one, but there's an ancient being. So like, you know, I don't know, Cthulhu. Uh, who is this? Azalin, the lich. Okay, so a lich, you know, you could have an ancient being. An aristocrat could be your patron commissioning you to do certain things. Uh, what else we got? A criminal syndicate. So you could work for a crime lord. They could be your patron. That could be fun. That sounds really fun. <laughs> it's almost like almost like running an evil campaign. But that with a twist, I feel. Um, a guild. You could just have a guild of some sort as your patron. And they're all going to have the same sort of layout. They have perks. They have a guild contact. Um, they have roles within the guild. They have guild quest suggestions. A military force. So you could serve as, you know, the Lances of Leleon or something. I don't know. And a religious order, so they could be your patron. The Church of Tyre or Torm or Helm or something. A sovereign, so you could work for a king or a queen. Nice. Being your own patron. Okay, cool. Yeah, this is solid. This is really solid. I like this. Um, I think this is a really good part of the book. I know I, I know I didn't really go through a whole lot of details, but it's mostly just it's the rules and mechanics for various types of patrons, and they're very cool, in my opinion. I really like them. But I'm way behind on my time schedule, so <laughs> we're not going to look at too many details on there. Didn't they add a DM patron or was that a homebrew red? Yeah, there's no DM patron in here. No, for sure not. Yeah, I feel like I feel like any of these patrons could be cool. The ones that interest me the most. Working for a king or queen. Meh. A religious order could be fun. I could see working for a religious order being lots of fun. The military. Yeah. The guild. Meh. The criminal syndicate. I think that would be really cool. The ancient being. If you had a really cool ancient being, imagine if like a lich were your patron. Your adventuring party essentially works for a lich. That could lead to some really fun, cool stuff. The academy, meh to me, but that's just me. You know, this is all personal preference and stuff, you know. Ultimately, the way that I would implement patrons is you know, your players would read through these and they would collectively collectively decide, hey, we want to play a game, a campaign where a criminal syndicate is our patron. Let your let your players decide It would be my suggestion. And then you form your campaign around that. Um, unless it was like, for instance, unless. Well, yeah, that, that's you could probably work with that. That'd be, that'd be really cool. All right. What's what's next on the agenda? Character options. A vampire? That would definitely be um, an, an elder being or an ancient an ancient being or whatever that was. There was one of those. It would be one of those for sure. It could be an aristocrat. It could be a vampire who's nobility and nobody knows he's a vampire. You could probably fit that in anything. You could have a vampire at the head of a criminal syndicate or anything like that. All right. Now we're going to go over to character options, you guys character options. This is probably the part that most people are are all giddy about or upset about. <laughs> this is like one or the other. You're going to like it and you're going to be like, or at least the first part, at least the first part of it. All right, let's 
go back to this. This is the beginning. Now we're going to the very beginning of the book. All right, we're probably going to spend some time at the very beginning here reading through some of this because there are some pretty impactful rule changes at the very beginning here that I feel are worth spending some time on. All right, so I'm just going to call that out right now. Oh, jeez. Somebody's calling me again. My mom doesn't get it. I can't talk to you when I'm streaming. Doesn't understand. All right, let's see. Using this book, thank you. It's all optional. Okay, yep. Okay, so it's all optional. Everything in this book is optional. Each group guided by the DM decides which of these options, if any, to incorporate into a campaign. You can use some, all, or none of them. We encourage you to choose the ones that fit best with your campaign's story and your group's style of play. Yes, I agree. Unearthed Arcana. Much of this material in this book originally appeared in Unearthed Arcana, a series of, yeah, we know what they are. Some Unearthed Arcana offerings don't end up resonating with fans and are set aside. That's because they use Unearthed Arcana to playtest their material and inform future book decisions. Yes, we are, we are, we are aware of this. We are your unpaid playtesters. Thank you. <laughs> Which isn't necessarily a horrible thing because you are getting material in advance to play around with and people like that. So I'm not knocking it necessarily. I'm just saying, calling it what it is. Um, everybody benefits from the relationship, I feel. It's it's okay. Um, the Unearthed Arcana material that inspired the options in the following chapters was well received, and thanks to feedback from thousands of D&D fans, has been refined into the official forms presented here. Okay, cool. That's, that's yeah, that's the way you make business decisions. Well, that's the way you make some business decisions. <laughs> um, ten rules to remember. Okay, I'm not going to go into detail on all these rules. Um... The DM adjudicates the rules. Yes, agreed. Exceptions supersede general rules. Yeah, these are mostly these are mostly things I think that were mentioned in Xanathar's, if I'm not mistaken. These are just general rules. Advantage and disadvantage, reaction timing, proficiency bonus, bonus action spells, concentration. None, none of this is new. This is all stuff that has always been in place. So they're I think they're just re they're just reiterating them, perhaps, to remind you. Because well here well, here's the thing, some of these some of these some of these are some of the most commonly confused or forgotten or mixed up rules, and they're putting them at the beginning, um, just so that it can be clear to you. So I mean, there's some value in that. They are elsewhere. They're just not not as conveniently easy to find or whatever. Okay, character options. Here we go. Oh, by the way, this is very cool art. I like this. This looks very, very slick. Very, very nice. Some sort of Feywild thing. The wizard Tasha studies magic outside the hut of her adoptive mo mother, Baba Yaga. Yeah, this is pretty cool. I like this. Hmm. I love the layout here. It, 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 they make it look like... They make it look like this illustration here continues over onto the next page like this is very 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 beautiful layout and then you got these little things up here and stuff like this is very nice layout like their their layout person really great job here the design and layout i, I really like that very very nice all right um customizing your origin i'm, I'm in this area right here at first level, and this is, we're going to go through a little slowly on this again, because there's some, there's some impactful stuff here. Um, you choose various aspects of, yes, we know. Yep, 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 we, we get it. Despite that versatility, a typical character race in D&D includes little or no choice. Correct, because you're choosing your race. You get to choose your race, guys. A, a lack that can make it difficult to realize certain characters' concepts. The agreed... A lack that can make it difficult to min-max, too. Um, <clears throat> the following subsections address that lack by adding choice to your character's race, allowing you to customize your ability scores, languages, and certain proficiencies to fit the origin you have in mind for your character. 
Character race in the game represents your character's fantasy species combined with certain cultural assumptions. The following options step up, step outside those assumptions to pave the way for truly unique characters. They also pave the way for homogenous characters where everybody pretty much is the same and there's nothing unique and different about the different races. So like they have couched this concept in very flowery words that make it seem like they're very forward facing and progressive and very, oh, we're going to help you accomplish blah, blah, blah. We're, we're on your side. We're going to help you do things. But the, but really what's happening, like <laughs> there's nothing distinctive about races anymore. So if the races are becoming just kind of more of the same, you know, like what makes a race stand out besides like the physical description you might give to it? If all of the ability scores and benefits and stuff are pretty much the same because we want you to have choice in what you do, and we want you to have freedom, then everything becomes homogenous and all mixes together and nothing is unique and distinctive. So let's keep that in mind. <clears throat> anyway, but they make it sound very nice. Of course they do. That's the proper way to write it. All right. Ability score increases. Whatever D&D race you choose for your character, you get a trait called ability score increase. Thank you for explaining the player handbook to me. This increase reflects an architectural bit of excellence in the, in the adventures of this kind in D&D's past. For example, if you're a dwarf, your constitution increases by two because dwarf heroes in D&D, I'm not trying to flip you off. <laughs> That was the finger that was convenient, sorry. <laughs> uh, for example, if you're a dwarf, your constitution increases by two because dwarf heroes in D&D are often exceptionally tough. Yes, because the race is exceptionally resistant, resilient, okay? That is the that is the dwarven race. Throughout all of the books everywhere, that is what they're known for, is being hardy dwarves. The same way that elves are known for being very agile. It, it, is, it is what is exceptional about them. And humans are known for being very versatile. It characterizes the races. Yes. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, in the same way that my cats are known for being cuddly and adorable. This, this increase doesn't apply to every dwarf, just to dwarf adventurers. And it exists to reinforce an archetype. That reinforcement is appropriate if you want to lean into the archetype. But it's unhelpful if your character doesn't conform to the archetype. Oh dear. Okay. If you'd like your character to follow their own path, you may ignore your ability score increase trait and assign ability score increases tailored to your character. Here's how to do it. Take, <laughs> here's how to do whatever you want. All right, here's how to do it. Take any ability score, increase you gain. Typography, typographical error right here. Increase you gain. I mean, I'm I'm kind of ripping on it, but produce. Here's the thing: producing a book like this, when you have a massive team of people working on it, you are going to miss things like this. It just happens. It's life. So I'm not really criticizing it too much. I am a writer. I understand how these things work. Um, just kind of. I'm just kind of picking on them. <laughs> I would to if you were to find a book of this size without any small errors like that. It would be an accomplishment worthy of the annals of history. So I'm just picking on them, but this is this is nothing unexpected. Um, take any ability score increase you gain in your race or sub race and apply it to an ability score of your choice. If you gain more than one increase, you can't apply those increases to the same ability score. OK, so if my. I can't keep doubling things up. Makes sense. For example, if the ability score increase trait of your race or sub race increases your constitution by two and your wisdom by one, you could instead increase your intelligence by two and your charisma by one. OK. This so this this is going to. I feel like I am split on this rule because as a player, Here's the thing. Here's the thing about this rule, you guys. It allows players to play 
the class they want with the race they want and not have to worry about, you know, for instance, if I want to play a wizard, but I want to be a dwarven wizard, that's usually a bad choice because my dwarven wizard is not going to be as powerful as my elven wizard or my human wizard, you know. Um, so this does give the players the ability to play, not feel confined by races and classes and just kind of play whatever concept they think is cool and fun. So it does give them the freedom to do that. Now, now, as a min-maxer, this rule is amazingly awesome to me because now I can min-max my character to my heart's content and still be the race of my choice. This, this opens up new avenues of possibility as a min-maxer that I, as an admitted min-maxer, would love to take advantage of. Let me tell you right now, I love this idea as a min-maxer. Um, as a dungeon master, I, and as a human being, I suppose, as a person with opinions and preferences, I do not like the idea of just making all races this kind of homogenous mix where everything is the same and there's really no defining characteristics anymore besides some flavor text on the side. That concept I do not particularly care for. Uh, it just makes everything the same. Um, and nothing is, when everything is the same, nothing is unique. When everything is the same, nothing is special. So I kind of don't like that idea. As a player, this is fun to me, but only because of the mechanical benefits that it bestows upon me. So those are my thoughts, I suppose, on that. I don't know. If your fun isn't tied to min-maxing, you would prefer to feel your race, wouldn't you? Exactly. Oh, I agree. Like, if, if I'm not a min-maxer, then I should be perfectly fine with playing a Dwarven Wizard and not have to change my stuff around. So if you want to role play for the sake of role playing, the fact that you are a little suboptimal should not impact your role playing. OK, you should have no problem with that. This 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 rule, like 90 percent caters to min maxers, to people who want to play a certain thing, but also want to have mechanical have all of the original mechanical benefits of min maxing. Yeah, that, I, I, I'm feeling that way. And it also waters down the races and makes them less special. If every snowflake is the same, you cannot have special snowflakes. I hate to break it to folks. <clears throat> okay, let's move on from that. I think I have covered that sufficiently before I get myself into trouble. <clears throat> Languages. Um, so basically, I think this says that you can switch around your languages however you want. So you don't have to, if you're a dwarf, you don't automatically just know common and dwarven. You're, you're able to choose other things. Um, I kind of feel like I'm okay with that. Um, that isn't too big of a deal to me, except, except, except that if I am playing a dwarf, in Descent into Avernus, you had better believe that I am going to drop Dwarf and pick up Abyssal or Infernal. Infernal, actually. I will 100% have a Dwarf who speaks Common and Infernal if I am playing Descent into Avernus. Again, it's catering to min maxers. That's the surface value of it to me from, from my, where I'm sitting in this chair. Why would an elf not know Elvish? Well, if they were orphaned or something and they grew up with humans or dwarves, they might know they might know something else. You know, that that there, there there's always a role playing justification for these sorts of things, you know? In the same way that these ability score increases, we could create a role playing justification. Why is my dwarf not have a plus 2 constitution? I was the runt of the litter. You know, I grew up impoverished and didn't get fed very well, so I was malnutritioned. And so my constitution is very low. However, I did have access to lots of books, which I studied a lot. And so I have a plus two to my intelligence. The thing is, is that you can always think up of backstories or role play reasons why these things are true. It's you're only limited by your creativity and your imagination. That's not really the problem. You know what I mean? So 
Okay, proficiencies. I, I have a feeling I know where this is going. You can swap any of your proficiencies around that you want, however you want. That's probably what this is gonna say. Let's just see this. Some races and sub races grant proficiencies. These proficiencies are usually cultural and your character might not have any connection with the culture in question or might have pursued different training. You can replace each of these proficiencies with a different one of your choice following the restrictions. Okay. So if you had a skill in a certain thing, you could swap it with something else. Okay. You Oh, this is interesting. You can't swap it for armor, though. So this... This has limited usefulness for min-maxing, in my opinion. If if I were able to swap, say, a tool proficiency for an armor proficiency, oh my word, I would have a field day as a min-maxer. A wizard who can wear heavy armor without having to splash one level of cleric. I would just have a field day with that. But since they don't allow me to pick up an armor proficiency, that limits the my min-max ability with this. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like you could still do some stuff with it, but it's not nearly as powerful. Can you imagine if you could swap out a, a simple weapon proficiency for heavy armor as a wizard? <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't have to splash one cleric. <laughs> so uh, I'm kind of like, eh, with that. That doesn't bother me too much. Oh, wait a second. A martial weapon for a tool is massive. Hold on. Let me look at that again. No, it doesn't say martial weapon. It says tool, a simple weapon. It it only gives you a simple weapon. I, I agree. A martial weapon would be huge, but it doesn't give you a martial weapon. It gives you a tool. You swap out a tool for a simple weapon, which is not, not nearly as powerful. Most characters are going to have proficiency with all simple weapons anyway, except for some that only get some of them. So it's not that big of a deal. I'm 95% of DM, so he's bashing them 95%. What? Who, min-maxers or something? Or players or what? Who am I bashing? <laughs> From a player's perspective, I like the choice, but I don't like what that means at a, at a higher level, as far as the game goes. Okay, custom lineage. Oh my gosh, we can just pretty much character. We can we can change everything we want. Instead of choosing one of the game's races for your character's first level, you can use the following traits to represent your character's lineage, giving you full control over how your character's origin shaped them. Holy crap, Ola! Jeez. How does this work? Hold on a second. You can use the following traits. So, oh my word. One ability score of my choice increases by two. I get a feat at first level. I get a variable trait and a language. This is, this is kind of like a min-maxer's paradise is what this looks like to me. Dang. I'm I'm kind of past the the rage rant point. <laughs> I'm just shaking my head at this point. I mean, if I'm a player in the game, I like these rules. <laughs> I like these rules if I'm a player because I can min max so much. Oh man, it's beautiful. It's a it's a min maxer's paradise, you guys. And, and, okay, so, 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 here's the thing, right? Game balance. How would these optional rules impact game balance? Like, if if we're no longer, if some of your players are no longer creating suboptimal characters and they're, they're allowed to min-max the crap out of this stuff, I have in my groups, one of my groups is full of min, not all of them are min-max, no, there's only there's only like two of them that are min maxers, but they're min maxers. They're min maxers. So 
how would these custom rules affect game balance? And what does that mean for me as a dungeon master when I, you know, I have to increase difficulty of things? It's not that big of a deal. I can increase the difficulty of things, you know, but it's worth considering how the game rules will impact, you know, you, what you have to do as a dungeon master to, to, to adjust for them. It's not just it's not just about giving players options. The, the ripple effects of giving players these options goes beyond just giving them options and, and choice in what they're doing. And I do not see that addressed anywhere in here. So. Yeah, no, you're right. You you increase the difficulty all the time. I agree. I, I, I don't think it's a big deal. Like if my players are min maxing more, I just increase the difficulty more. I, I, I adjust it. It's not that big of a deal. I adapt to it. Yeah. You know, but but the thing is, I'm an experienced dungeon master. I know how to do that. Right. Like can do can new dungeon masters easily do that? Are they? I mean, you know what I mean? Is that easy for them? I don't know. And, and how do they know how much? It's It's like, you know what I'm saying? It's like you have a core rule system and you're just you're introducing these variables into it. You know what I mean? And like, I don't have a problem with it. I'll deal with it. Not a big deal. But is everybody equally as able to figure it out? You know what I mean? Or is it going to be more difficult for them? You see what I'm saying? So, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm giving myself too much credit. Maybe this stuff isn't as hard as I think it is. Maybe being a dungeon master is easy and everybody can do it in their sleep. I don't know. Hey, what do I know? Maybe making the dungeon master's job more difficult is not that big of a deal and I should just calm down. I don't know. <laughs> By the way, I see a couple of uh, subscriptions. <laughs> Bamf, thank you so much for the prime and Sultor. Thank you for the tier one. I really appreciate that. <clears throat> All right. Um, let's keep going. We're almost to the artificer. We are almost to the artificer. Changing a skill. Sometimes you pick a skill proficiency that ends up not being very useful in the campaign or that no longer fits your character's story. Yes. In those cases, talk with your DM about replacing that skill proficiency with another skill proficiency offered by your class at first level. <laughs> oh. Just change anything you want. Don't even follow the rules anymore. Just do whatever you want. <sighs> a convenient time for a change is when you reach a level that grants you the ability to score increased feature. Represent it. Why, why do we even have rules? If we can just change whatever we want, then why do we even have classes? And can we just get rid of the rule books and just do everything narratively? With, you know, do we need the rules anymore? Can we, you know, I, I don't know. I'm going down a rabbit hole here. The rules mean nothing anymore. You can do whatever you want. <clears throat> it now seems like these rules make the player handbook optional. Um, yeah. Yeah, because you can pretty much do what you want. You can make your own. You Listen, you can pretty much make your own race and class almost not. Well, race for sure. Certain elements of your class, you can just change them up however you want. Like the skill proficiencies and stuff. Yeah. Huh. OK. So I don't know who. So we have we have Xanathar's and then we have Tasha's. Whoever comes after Tasha is pretty much just going to throw out all of the rules and just tell you to do whatever the heck you want. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I should calm down and, and keep moving here. Don't listen to me. I'm just an, I'm just a, just a grumpy old man. <laughs> OK, let's keep going. Changing your subclass. OK, here we go. Each character class involves the choice of a subclass at first, second or third level. A subclass represents an area of specialization and offers different class features as you level up. With your DM's approval, you can change your subclass when you would normally gain a new subclass feature. If you decide to make this change, choose another subclass that belongs to your class and replace all your old subclass features with the feature of the new subclass that... Okay. There might They might enforce some training time to make the subclass change. Okay. Okay. 
I don't know how I feel about that. Sometimes a character undergoes a dramatic transformation in their beliefs and abilities. When a character experiences a profound self-realization or faces an entity or a place of overwhelming power, blah, 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 blah. What is this? What are we going with this? Oh, the DM might allow an immediate subclass change. Oh, okay, so there are certain... Okay, so basically, okay, there we go. So now we just gave there now now you can just come up with a, a nice role playing situation to immediately impact and affect a, a, a subclass change. I don't know how I feel about the subclass changes. Here's the thing, like this, this being able to change your subclass is a little different than just changing anything and everything you want about your the mechanics of your race and stuff. Changing a subclass is like you're still following the rules of the subclass and stuff. But if if a player has chosen it, let's pretend that you are a let's pretend that you're you are a barbarian and you chose the berserker barbarian, which is just horribly, horribly abysmal. And you didn't realize that at first and you play it for a while and then you're like, all of my class abilities suck. I am not having fun. This game is horrible. I hate my barbarian. Like, I as a dungeon master want you to have fun, and I don't want you to be stuck with the worst subclass archetype of the Barbarian. I would probably just allow you to change it as a dungeon master because I want you to have fun. So, like, I feel like this isn't that big of a deal to be able to change your subclass, to train out of it, or to have... I, I just, like, if my player... I had a player once who was playing a Barbarian, and she hated it. Not a Barbarian, a Bard. She was playing a bard and she hated it. And she's like, Luke, can I play a barbarian? I think I'd enjoy it. I'm like, yes, next session, come with a barbarian and you will play a barbarian. And she came with a barbarian and she loved it. So like, I don't want my players to be stuck playing like something they don't like. And so just swapping it to something different, that seems more reasonable to me. You know what I mean? That's just like, I don't know. I feel like that's different than some of these other things we've been talking about before. But that's just my feelings on it, so. I mean, yes, Sparta Bear, that's true. Min maxers would change because some subclasses are better than others in certain levels. Yes, that's true. If you felt like they were doing that, then you could address that in a one-off situation. Yeah, I, I'm not too worried about that. If you felt that were happening, then you could address that, I feel. The same way that I would address a character who a player who always wants to play a different class. Okay, let's get into some of the actual classes here. Now, now, now we are going to get into the meat of the new character options. Um, probably things that I'm going to be a whole lot happier about <laughs> than what we just got through. So it's time to get happy again. Artificer. Okay, so. The Artificer is also in the Eberron campaign setting, and I've already read through the Artificer in the Eberron campaign setting, and I can tell you that it is amazing. It, it is very, very, very cool. Um, I love the Artificer. I don't really know where it lies in like the power scale compared to other classes. Um, I would venture a guess to say the Artificer is pretty powerful, though, as power goes. But of course, Paladin is still my shining example of a very, very, very powerful class. Um, but I don't know if Artificer surpasses it. I just know that it is really cool. So stop biting me, Squeaky. My cat is below my desk, biting my feet because he wants attention. He does this all the time. He's so jealous. <laughs> um, This is cool artwork, too. That's really cool artwork. I like that. Um, so we got a table with Artificer. There, there. Now there are four archetypes of Artificers. Um, you're getting a whole new class, a very cool class, by the way. I've already mentioned that. And I mean, I'm not going to read through every little bit of it because we will never finish this flip through. Um, I can tell you that it's amazing. Um, they have a lot to do with magic. They, they obviously they're an artificer, so they can tinker with magical things. Um, 
how is this? So they have things called infusions. They can basically infuse, they can infuse items with magical properties. So they can essentially create magic items to a certain extent, um, which is really cool. And then they have spells. So their spell progression is similar to maybe a paladin or a rogue. They don't get like ninth level spells and stuff like that. Um, and they have cantrips and stuff. This is probably going to play very similar to a warlock, I feel. It feels like a warlock where you have like, you know, instead of invocations, you have infusions, you know, warlocks. I don't think warlocks go up to super high spell. Maybe they do, but it's similar. It's similar in play to a warlock, I feel. Um, you have a they have their own special artifice or spell list, which is outlined here. And. It's got some cool stuff on there. I think they have some cool spells. And then we have the infuse item thing where they can. Oh, it's describing the rules about how they can infuse different items. Number of infusions known. They can infuse items with magical properties. And they have different features. OK, so these are this is this is where they can at third level. So third level is when they can choose their archetype. Choose the type of specialist you are, an alchemist, an armorer, an artillerist, or a battlesmith. Now, the armorer is new. That is not in Eberron campaign setting. So that's a new sub archetype for um, for the uh, the artificer. And it looks like we get thieves tools, proficiency or artisans tools. Oh, wait, no, wait, no, no, no. Oh, you can magically create one set of artisans tools in an occupied space. Oh, wow. OK, so you can create tools with an hour of work. That's pretty cool. It can be useful. Tool expertise. Got it. Flash of genius. Magic item adept. You can attune up to four magic items at once. Yeah, there's there's some really cool stuff here. You can now store a spell in an object. That's cool. Magic item savant. You can attune up to five magic items at once. You can now attune up to six magic items at once. Oh, man, that's really good. <laughs> OK, the 20th level feature. You have developed a mystical connection to your magic items. You gain a plus one bonus to all saving throws per magic item you are currently attuned to. Holy crap, that's that is very nice. If you reduce to zero hit points but not killed outright, you can use your reaction to end one of your artificer infusions. OK, that's cool. And that's that is very nice. That is a, it's level 20. It's level 20, obviously, but that's really cool. You can be an alchemist, so. I'm not going to be able to read through all of these things here. An alchemist is an expert at combining reagents to produce mystical effects. Alchemists use their creations to give life and to leech it away. Yeah, when I was reading the alchemist in the Eberron camp setting, it, it, it essentially felt like a healer of sorts. You can obviously. Oh, man, when you finish a long rest, you can magically produce an experimental elixir in an empty flask. And you can have different effects like healing, swiftness, resilience and stuff. This is pretty cool. This is really, really cool. Arcane Armorer. All right, now this is new. This is this was not in the Eberron campaign setting. Um, yes, this definitely is powerful. Like, I feel like the artificer is probably very toward the top of the power curve. Um. Mm. Yeah, it probably does play like a bard where it's versatile, but not the best at anything that probably is accurate. I feel. All right, an artificer who specializes as an armorer modifies armor to function almost like a second skin. The armor is enhanced to hone the artificer's magic, unleash potent potent attacks and generate a formidable defense. The artificer bonds with this armor, becoming one with it, even as they experiment with it and refine its magical capabilities. You gain proficiency with heavy armor. OK, cool. 
You always have certain spells prepared. Okay, arcane armor. So you can turn your armor into something special. You can use you can use your armor as a spellcasting focus. Nice. The armor attaches to you and can't be removed against your will. Oh, nice. <laughs> that is wow. Crazy. You can customize your magical armor. Guardian or infiltrator. Each model includes a special weapon. When you attack with the weapon, you, oh my goodness. You can add your intelligence modifier instead of strength or dexterity to the attack and damage rolls. Okay, there we go. So we now have an artificer who can become super like a good fighter like a good fighter type okay with heavy armor they can use their intelligence modifier or okay that's that's very nice so that is very similar to the hexblade warlock that can use their charisma bonus to their attack rules and damage modifiers that's really cool thunder gauntlets oh nice cool or a defensive shield and infiltrator a lightning launcher a gem knight, a gem like node appears on one of your armored fists or your chest. <laughs> Iron Man. <laughs> Hello, Iron Man. <laughs> it counts as a simple ranged weapon and deals 1d6 lightning damage and a hit. Cool. Extra attack, you get extra attack. Okay. So this is basically the fighter version of an artificer. Yeah, this is nice. This is this is Iron Man, you guys. Can they fly? Can they fly? When when do they get to learn how to fly? So if you want to play Iron Man, the armor artificer is your is what you want to do. Yeah, that, that seems really cool. Now the artillerist, I thought the artillerist was really cool because they get to make an Eldritch cannon. Um, it's basically a, a cannon that can travel with you and it it's like a companion. It's kind of like a it's not a pet, but it's yeah, it's a it's a cool little thing that travels with you. But they basically just they hurl destructive power into the battlefields and stuff. I thought this was this sounded pretty cool. It didn't really appeal to me a whole lot, but and then you get an arcane firearm. You you know how to turn a wand, staff or rod into an arcane firearm or a conduit for your destructive spells. Oh, does that just Oh, that just allows you to use it as a uh, as an arcane focus. Oh, that's not that big of a deal. Fortified position. There were there. It it seemed okay to me. The honestly the yeah the artillerist didn't appeal to me personally. But yeah. the battlesmith. Armies require protection, and someone has to put things back together. Th the defenses fall apart. A combination of protector and medic, a battlesmith is an expert at defending others and repairing both material and personnel. Okay. So they have proficiency with smith's tools. They have some spells. Some protection type spells, it looks like. Proficiency with martial weapons. Okay. Oh, the steel defender! <gasps> ah! The steel defender. Oh, this is really cool. Now, I love the idea of the Steel Defender. Um, and I think the mechanic they have here for the armor class and the hit points and stuff going up and the saving throws go up. Basically, the, the Steel Defender kind of levels up with you as an artificer. This, you guys, think about the Ranger from the Player Handbook, how horrible it was. This is the sort of mechanic they should have implemented for the Ranger's Animal Companion in the Player Handbook, um, originally, to have it level up with you and get better as you level up. And and then the Ranger wouldn't have been the worst class in the entire game, for like the longest time. Um, so this is really this is really cool, you guys. Very very cool. I I like this. Okay, now we have the infusions. <clears throat> Looks like we're having some fun in chat. 
<laughs> um, so there's a bunch. These are a bunch of infusions you can put into objects and stuff to make them magical. Basically, you can do some special stuff to your armor, make your armor special. Boots of the Winding Path. All right. Um, you can teleport. Oh, nice. Looks like some of some of them do have prerequisites to use them. Certain levels and stuff. You can make a magical weapon. Oh, nice. These infusions are really powerful. These are really powerful. I can you can have a magic weapon at level. Hold on. What level can I make a magic weapon as an artificer? Level two. So at level two, at level two, as an artificer, I can make two magic weapons for my group, bypassing all resistances that monsters might have. You guys, that's that is, that's game changing. That's very, very powerful. Very, very, very powerful. That you cannot underestimate how powerful that is. Um, and it becomes a plus two when you reach level 10. That's a that's like a must have. You will always take that. Homoculus Servant, that's cool. Helm of Awareness. The wearer can't be surprised. Okay, that's cool. As long as it's only the wearer and not the entire group. Then they have, again, again, look at this. Stat block for Homunculus Servant. And it grows as you grow according to your level. As a artificer, that is very intelligent design. Thank you for getting it right. It only took, you know... Why, why, why wasn't it like this in the player handbook for fifth edition? Like the, why wasn't the Rangers animal companion like this? It's not like, it's not like this was the first edition of D and D. This is the fifth edition of the game. You know, it's like, why couldn't we have gotten this right? The first time we made the player handbook, I, I, I feel like after five editions, we should have realized that if you give somebody a companion, it should scale with your level. I, I feel like that's kind of obvious. But what do I know? Radiant weapon, repeating. Yeah, there you guys, there's oh, oh, and then we can and then we can simply replicate a magic item. One of the infusions you can get is to replicate a magic item. And here is a list of different magic items that you can replicate as an artificer. Um, very, very, very cool and powerful, powerful. OK, so basically, um. Artificer is definitely I feel like I mean, you you won't know until you actually play one and see it in in play at a game. You don't actually know until you see an action. But I feel like the Artificer class is very powerful. It definitely feels like it's super, super powerful and pimped out. Um, That said, as a player, if, if, if I'm a player, this gets me very excited. To me as a player, this is an amazing class, and I think I would have tons of fun playing it. Um, as a dungeon master, I'm like, this seems powerful, um, but I can adjust my game if, if, if the group is really powerful. That doesn't concern me a whole lot, in all honesty. I've been doing it for a while. Um, definitely Artificer seems like a very solid class, and I, I, I think it's going to be it would be tons of fun to play. So that's the new class you got. You got the Artificer. All right. It's the infusions. I feel like the infusions are the thing that really are just like, woo. Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a fair point. It is not a new class in so much that it was included in Eberron and mostly just reproduced here. And they gave you a new archetype to, to kind of be like, look, look, we tried. <laughs> we tried to give you new content, right? Oh, I don't even know when I got to that. Man, it's probably like around. All right, now we are getting into some of the new um, standard classes, new archetypes, and new options for the standard classes. We're gonna go through these pretty quickly. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on these. Um, we will we will never get through all of these bunches of pages here, but we will get a little bit of a teaser here or, or a quick walkthrough of the different things. So, barbarian. 
you get some new features and subclasses. So it says, you gain class features in the player's handbook when you reach certain levels. This section offers additional features that you can gain as a barbarian. Unlike the features in the player's handbook, you don't gain the features here automatically. Consult with your DM. You decide whether you gain a feature in this section if you meet the requirements noted in the features description. These features can be selected separately from one another. You can use both or none of them. Oh. So these would be... What I would do with these is I would... If you wanted to use these, I would use these in, in replacing an existing feature. So whatever third level feature is already in the player handbook, this might replace it. I would not add these on top of it. To me, that's just increasing the power creep of everything. Um, I would make these where you can exchange it if you don't like the other one sort of thing. So you have some options. Path of the Beasts. So you have a new primal path, obviously. Barbarians who walk the path of the beast draw their rage from a bestial spark within. Okay. Oh, you can take on different forms? Oh, you transform. Oh, cool. So you get bite, claw, tail. I mean, that's, that sounds cool. I'm not, I, I can't read through it all. We don't have time for that. Path of the wild magic. So barbarians that have some sort of wild magic infused in them. Okay, cool. All right, that sounds fun. And the bard. Additional bard spells. Oh, we're giving them more spells? The spells in the following list expand the bard spell level. This list is organized by spell level. We're just giving them new stuff. The way this is presented... The, the way... <laughs> The way this is presented, they present this as though you get these in addition to what you already get as a bard or as a barbarian. They're giving you additional features and stuff, <sighs> which I suppose is a way to help existing classes keep up with the power creep when you introduce things like the artificer that seems very powerful. But, you know, it is what it is. But it looks like they're suggesting new features that you might get in addition to the existing ones, which I'm not sure how I feel about that, but. Oh, an additional Bard College, College of Creation. OK. Um, and then we have a College of Eloquence. I mean, they're they're Yeah. More more options, I feel, are, you know, it, it, for players is a good thing. So I don't think there's anything wrong with this stuff. I, I unfortunately I don't have time to like read them thoroughly and analyze them and give thoughts deeper on that. We're really just doing a quick flip through here to show you guys what there is in here. Okay, cleric. Additional cleric spells. Okay, here's some more cleric spells. Congratulations. Oh wow. So we're just gonna give you a whole bunch of stuff. Let's just give you a whole bunch of stuff as a cleric. Okay, now we have new divine do, divine domains, order domain. And you're going to get some new domain spells, of course. A peace domain. <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons, folks. All right. Um, peace deities. OK, new domain spells. You're going to have some class features and stuff. That makes sense. A twilight domain. So we got three new domains for clerics. This is cool artwork, by the way. That's very, very slick. I like that. New domain spells. You have dark vision, dark vision out to a range of 300 feet. That's nice. Druid. Oh, we're going to give you some new druid spells here. Here are some druid spells for you. Just take some spells. A wild companion. Oh, Druid, oh, with this feature, a druid can now cast Find Familiar. <laughs> it was just like... <laughs> now druids get a familiar. Which... Which kind of feels thematically appropriate. Of a, a druid having like a little animal companion. That does feel thematically appropriate, I feel. 
Um, some new druid circles. Circle of spores. Oh, nice. Fungi. They find beauty and decay. They see within mold and other fungi the ability to transfer. That's really cool. Really, really nice artwork. This is very cool. I like that. Wow. So you got a new druid circle and circle of stars. There's another druid circle for you. And circle of wildfire. Destruction. Oh, nice. <laughs> I like that. Okay, so fighter. We have some new fighting styles. Blind fighting. Interception. Superior technique. So what I would do with the fighting styles is when you... If you were to use these, when you get would normally get a fighting style, you could choose one of these instead. But that's cool. More options. Maneuvers. Oh, for battle masters. Nice. I kind of like that. Immediately after you hit a creature with a melee attack on your turn, you can expend one spirit to die and try to grapple the creature as a bonus action. Oh, that's pretty powerful. Shoving and grappling are really good combinations in 5th edition. <clears throat> Archetypes. The Psy Warrior. Ooh, Psionics. Psionics has come. Many get the Yankee trained to be such warriors. Yeah, this is cool. I mean, just thematically, just the idea of a warrior with psionic power. I think that's cool. A rune knight. Oh, they, they enhance their okay. That's cool. So you got another type of ah, that's cool. I like that. Battle master builds. What the heck is this? What is this? A martial archetype option in the player's handbook, the battle master showcases just how versatile a fighter can be. Lower recommendations for how you might build a battle master to reflect various types of warriors. Ah. That's that's actually kind of cool. I kind of like that. So if you have an idea of the type of warrior that you want to play, this will give you guidelines and what you can choose that would help you to. And then it gives you ideas on different feats you would take. I kind of like this. I think that's pretty cool. I mean, obviously, this is like not new content. I, it kind of is. I mean, it's just like here are suggestions for how you might put different things together. But I think that's pretty cool. A lot of YouTubers are getting attention with the build videos. So Wizards of the Coast had to get a piece of that action. <laughs> this is good artwork. I like this. This is very cool. Monk. All right, so we have more monk class options. We have a new monastic tradition. Way of Mercy. So we have one Way of Mercy. We have, wow, that's a lot of rules for one tradition. Oh, nope, I, I, I didn't see it here. Way of the Astral Self. Oh, that's interesting. This is very cool artwork, by the way. It's very, very nice. Paladin. So some fighting style options for Paladins. Cool. And Sacred Oaths. So we're going to get some more Oaths. Oath of Glory. Oath of the Watchers. Okay. So you got two, two different Oaths for Paladins that were added to it. The Ranger. Nobody plays Rangers. Um, but if you do, canny. So there's okay, cool. Got some different things here. Favored foe. Oh, jeez. More ranger spells. Fighting options. Blind fighting. Okay, cool. Thrown weapon fighting. Primal Awareness? That sounds very familiar. That's from Unearthed Arcana. That's from... Okay, hold on a second.
You can focus your awareness through the interconnections of nature. Oh, you can learn additional fell spells. Oh, okay. Well, something about that sounds familiar. I can't put my finger on it, though. Primal awareness. One of my players has something that does something like that, and it's super powerful. But I think we got that from North Arcana, though, and we had to change it because it was way too powerful. Okay, Ranger Archetypes, a Fey Wanderer. Interesting. And you have a Swarm Keeper. Oh, no way! Oh! You guys, that just sounds really fun. A Gnome Swarm Keeper. It has like a swarm of like, uh, Crickets and grasshoppers and stuff around it. Grasshoppers, locusts. Call them locusts. That is cool. I like that. Just thematically, just thematically, the idea of a ranger going into battle with a swarm of locusts or, or butterflies around him. It could, be, it could be a swarm of butterflies. Oh, that's really cool. I like that. Oh, beast master companions. All right. The beast master in the player's handbook forms a mystical bond with an animal as an alternative because yes, you need an alternative. <laughs> you can take the future blow to form a bond with a special primal beast instead. Yes, you must because of that option in the, in the player handbook is horrible. And, and what they are doing now is what they should have done in the original release of the player's handbook. You have animal companions that gain power with you as you level up. This is how it should have been implemented five or six years ago or however long it's been. So that's that is good. This this now makes well, did I feel like they changed. They did something before, too, that made Rangers animal companions better and scale up with them. But that might have been from Unearth Arcana. I have trouble keeping, you know, the published material apart from the Unearth Arcana stuff that they release. But this is good. This is very good. This is this is good. Was it Unearthed Arcana Revised Ranger? Okay. It was Unearthed Arcana. They may be making it canon. Okay, cool. I mean, this is good. This, this is what the Ranger has needed for a long, long time. Rogue. All right, we got some new... A new archetype of Phantom. So we got one archetype Phantom. We have another archetype called the Soul Knife. That looks really cool. Um, that's it. So we got two. Did we get two of them? It's hard to tell. The way they do their titles, they look so much the same. Their main, their main titles and the subtitles look so similar. It's hard to find stuff. That that is a complaint. That is an official complaint. I will be contacting the complaint department about that. Thank you. The sorcerer. Additional sorcerer spell. Okay, sorcerer. How many how many archetypes did we get? Or sorceress origins are what they called. The aberrant mind. Ooh, new meta new meta magic options. That's good. Cool. Um, aberrant mind. So we have one. We have aberrant mind. Oh, which is a psionic thing. Sounds like that's a psionic sorcerer. Cool. Um I always thought psionics were interesting and fun in D&D. &D. Um, I've always I always thought that I always thought it was just really cool that you could have powers of the mind, you know. And so when I see psionic stuff, that to me seems really cool. Just thematically. Now, in previous editions, the rules mechanics by which they implemented th psionics may not have always been good, but thematically, the concept I've always thought was really cool. And then we have a clockwork soul. No, that's this artwork is really good, you guys. It's got like little gears and stuff, runes lighting up along his skin. That's really cool. I like that. Warlock. New Eldritch invocation options. Okay, cool. Otherworldly patrons, the fathomless. Something from the depths of the water or the plane of elemental water. The genie. You could have a genie as a patron. Oh, nice. <laughs> I like that. Limited wish. 
What is this? You entreat at 14th level, you entreat your patron to grant you a small wish. As an action, you speak your desire to your genie's vessel, requesting the effect of one spell that is 6th level or lower. Okay. You can't use it again until you finish 1d4 long rests. That's pretty cool. Wizard. So now we're we're adding more spell lists. Every, everybody gets everything. Oh, you know what, though? Some of these are spell... Oh, you know what they're doing, you guys? A lot of these spells are spells from different, like, not from the player handbook, but from different supplements and stuff. And so they're expanding your spell list with spells that they've created in subsequent um, uh, splat books, basically, is what, is what it looks like to me. So that's, that's actually pretty cool. Okay, we have Blade Singing. Ah! First of all, this was in Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, for the record. However, since Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide is a pretty crappy supplement, and most people should not buy it, um, it is handy to have it reproduced here. Because <laughs> Blade Singing, a Blade Singer is very, very, very fun. A Wizard Blade Singer is, oh, I love it. They probably don't restrict you to being an elf, though. Lore-wise, only elves were blade singers, but I'm sure, I'm sure since the theme of this book is that race doesn't, like your race choices can just be whatever and you can do whatever you want. Um, I doubt that they would restrict you. Yeah, it literally says here. Originally created by elves, this tradition has been adopted by non-elf practitioners who honor and expand on the elven ways. Of course, they're gonna let anybody do it. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want to restrict this to only elves now. Um, I, I'm actually kind of okay with that. <laughs> like, if I want to be a blade singer, yeah, I would not want to have to be an elf necessarily. As a play, from a player's standpoint. Now, if you look at lore and stuff, there's a different argument there. Order of scribes. Okay, so you got you have two new. Two new arcane traditions. No, no, no. Let me rephrase that. One arcane tradition that's new. The other one has been recycled from a book that's like four or five years old. A dwarf blade singer using an axe. And you could totally do that too. Yeah, you could you could do all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Oh, they beefed up the blade singer? Okay, we are on to feats now. We are on feats. All right, I'm gonna get a drink of coffee, and then we're gonna look at we're gonna look at feats. I'm not going to look at all of these. A chef. <laughs> As part of a short rest, you can cook special food provided you have ingredients. You can prepare enough of this food for a number of creatures equal to four plus your proficiency bonus. So your entire party. At the end of the short rest, any creature who eats the food and spends one or more hit dice it's an extra 1d8 hit points. Okay, that's cool. Hmm. It's interesting. Eldritch Adept. Oh, so this is only for warlocks, basically. You learn one Eldritch invocation option of your choice from the warlock class. Oh, okay. So you just get an extra one. Fey touched. You learn Misty Step. Okay. And then obviously you're getting like a bonus to some ability score as well. 
fighting initiate. Initiate. You have to have a person with a martial weapon. Oh, you get a fighting style. So you get to choose a fighting style option. A gunner. You gain proficiency with firearms. Okay. You ignore the loading property of firearms. Metamagic adept. So you, it looks like you have to be... You spell cat. Oh, you this anybody can. Oh, wow. Oh, oh, whoa. So anybody can basically have meta magic. Then any spellcaster can have meta magic. That's nice. And then you get sorcery points as well. Oof, oof. A piercer. Oh, okay. Who plays Sorcerer? <laughs> yeah, Meta Magic Adept it could be very, very nice in the right hands. Yeah. Poisoner. All right. So you're going to Shadow Touch. What's that? You learn the invisibility spell in one first level spell of your choice. You can cast each of these spells without expending a spell slot. What? Oh, oh, you, you, okay, once per long rest. Okay, once per long rest, that's fair. Skill expert. You gain proficiency in the skill of your choice. Okay. Slasher. Telekinetic. Learn mage hand. Telepathic. Yeah, I mean, these feats seem cool. Yeah. The these seem cool. There's not a whole lot of them. There's like there's like one page here to so you got like, you know, what is that? 12, maybe 12. 12 ish new feats, basically. So not a whole lot of them. And they seem cool and interesting. So that should be fun. Yeah, there are always going to be some that are maybe too strong or something. The meta magic adept, I feel, is probably one of them. That seems pretty powerful. Um, but whatever. All right. Next. What's next on our agenda? Let us see what we have going on here. Um, all right. Magical miscellany. I'm a little behind schedule, but um, it should not take us too long to go through the magical miscellany. We, we got spells and magic items. This what this won't take us very long. I'm not gonna read every single one of them, obviously. Um, so won't take too much longer to get through this. And that is on page. What page is that on? Let's let's go to the table of contents and let's see what page this is on. Page 105. Yeah. Oh, you guys. Artwork. This artwork is really cool. Very, very cool artwork. I love that crap. And again, beautiful layout. Look how this purple travels up along the corner here on the other page and we have some stuff going on. This is very, very, very nice layout. I love this. I love the full page artwork. This is super cool. So this says in her lab, Tasha confers with the demon Lord Grast through a magical mirror. Oh man. This is so cool. <laughs> okay. Spells. Magic is everywhere. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. This section contains new spells that the DM may add to a campaign. Yeah, that makes sense. And it looks like... Is this the list of the spells? Okay, so... Right off the bat, I can tell you, this looks like this is, this is, these are the spells. You're getting about 20, roughly 20 new spells. And wide variety of different 
classes can use them. Um, I am going to tell you that some of these are duplicates from previous stuff, like Booming Blade, Lightning Lure. Those are from Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, I believe. Most of these, most of these, though, look like new spells. I don't know that they exist elsewhere. Um, now the summoning spells, I I want to take a particular look at the summoning spells because I I kind of like how they did the summons for these summoning spells. These, this is one part of Tasha's that I, I took a look at before this stream. Most of it I haven't looked at. So the way they did the summoning spells, which I really like, is when you summon any any of the summoning spells in this in this thing, you basically summon one creature, one creature. And then um, the strength of that creature is a little bit variable depending upon certain things like the armor class is 11 plus the level of the spell. And so basically, if you upcast the spell, if I, I think that's how it works. Yeah. See, when you when you cast this spell using a spell of fifth flat or higher, use the higher level whenever the spells level appears in the stat block. So basically at fourth level, I can cast this summon aberration or a bestial spirit. Well, it's bestial spirits, a second level spell. But anyway, let's look at this one. So at fourth level, I can summon this aberration and the armor class is 11 plus the level will be four. So 15 the hit points I'm going to if I upcast this spell at fifth level, sixth level, etc. This this aberrant spirit is going to get more and more powerful as I upcast it and use higher slots. So what I what I like about this, the reason I like this is that most summoning spells summon lots of monsters, which can bog the game down and due to action economy makes it very, very powerful. But what I like about the fact that a summoning spell gives you one of something and it just gets more powerful as you upcast it is that it doesn't bog the game down as much because you're only getting one of the creature and action economy isn't affected nearly as much as when you have a horde of little creatures. Hey, chair fighter, stop by at a different stream and I can answer your question, dude. Tonight, we're really just looking at Tasha's, um, but I will, I'll, I'll be happy to answer your question. Um, I'll be streaming, come by next week on Wednesday, I believe, and I'll be answering questions and then I can hook you up, dude. But tonight we're really just looking at Tasha's. So yeah, that's, that's my, that, those are my main comments. I think on the spells, um, there's lots of summoning spells which all have the same mechanic. Basically, you get one of the thing and then it levels up as you upcast it. And I think that's pretty cool. I like that. Oh, wow. Very, very cool artwork. <laughs> very, very cool. And more summoning spells. Yeah, you could make an argument that it could have just been one spell and you just get to pick the different type of teacher creature you summon. You could make that argument um, that makes it more difficult to thematically split them among the different classes, of course, because you might say that, you know, an undead spirit is a warlock or a cleric spell, perhaps. But maybe not appropriate for a druid, you know what I mean? So. And personalizing spells. What does that mean? OK, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? It's like it's like any time I almost feel like my guard is up now. Anytime they're suggesting that we can customize and personalize things. It's like, OK, what are you doing now? What are you doing now? Blah, 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 blah. Introductory text. OK. When customizing your spellcaster, your spellcaster's magic, consider developing a theme. It sounds like we're just talking about, oh, this is just flavor. This is just OK, this OK, OK, whatever. So this whole personalizing spells is all about just adding flavor to your spell effects to fit some sort of theme that you have for your character. 
which you don't need rules for. You can just do that anyway, but it's cool. So it, it yeah, there's not, that's good. That's good. Okay, magic items. All right, now we're looking at magic items. And it looks like it looks like it gives us a list of all of the magic items that are here. Prosthetic limb. Arcane grimoire. So we have common ones, some uncommon ones. Rare ones. A Far Realm shard. It looks like a lot of these require attunement too. Almost all of them require attunement. And that's cool artwork. I like that. That's very cool. Almost every one of these requires attunement, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It just means it's powerful. It's a powerful magic item. Um, rare, very rare legend. Oh, we have some artifacts. Oh, it gives you some more artifacts. That is very cool. I like that. Because there aren't that many artifacts in the Dungeon Master Guide to begin with. Well, the Dungeon Master Guide does give you some rules to create your own artifacts, of course. Um, but that's cool. Magic tattoos. Oh! Nice. What does this say? Blending magic and artistry with ink and noodles. Once inscribed on a creature's body, damage, or injury. How does that work? What are the wondrous abilities? I don't understand what that means. So it doesn't really explain how magic tattoos actually work, but I'm assuming that if you get a magic tattoo, it emulates an existing magic item. That would be my guess. So you could get a tattoo, for instance, that has like boots of flying or something, and it would just be tattooed to your body. That means that there would have to be people that, that perform that service, which means you could buy it. Okay. I mean, that's an interesting concept. And then we have a bunch of different things here. Baba Yaga's Mortar and Pestle. Oh, that's an artifact. Oh, man. I mean, I don't have time to read through all of these, but this sound, that sounds cool. That's a good artwork, too. Nice. A Cauldron of Rebirth. Blood Fury tattoo. Oh, oh, there are actually lots of tattoos here. I'm sorry. So it, it actually gives you like sample tattoos. Like there are a bunch of tattoos here. And there's a there's a there's a there's a barrier tattoo. There's a blood fury tattoo. Coiling grasp tattoo. I mean that's pretty cool to have a different type of magic item, a tattoo. Ooh, what is this? Crystalline Chronicle. Wondrous item. What is this thing? Demonicon of Igwilly? Well, that's an artifact. Oh, nice. That That is a really cool artwork, too, by the way. Super sweet. Yes, there are definitely some witch themes items going on. Yeah. This is cool. Far Realm Shard. As an action, you can attach the, the shard to a tiny object. Um, you can use a spell casting photos. When you use a meta magic option on a spell, you can cause. Oh, interesting. Huh. Feywild Shard. An Elemental Essence Shard. Oh, this is cool. Another tattoo. An Eldritch Claw Tattoo.
Lots of tattoos. Lots of tattoos, you guys. A ghost step tattoo, illuminator's tattoo, life well tattoo. Um, this is interesting. The watermark here, right down the page. Um, I don't know if I like that as a design choice because it lowers the contrast of the text on the page, making it a little bit more difficult to read. Not too bad, but whatever. Lubra's Taroka of Souls. That's really cool artwork. I like that. That sounds like that sounds like an artifact. Yes, yeah, so we have another artifact. Ooh, ooh, what is this? That looks cool. What is this? Mighty Servant of Luko. It is a fantastically powerful 10 foot tall machine that turns into an animate, animate construct when piloted. When piloted? That means you get inside it? Oh, no way. While any, while any creatures are attuned to the artifact, attuned creatures can open the hatch as easily. So you get inside of it and you pilot it around. Oh, wow. You guys, that is really cool. I mean, it's an artifact, so you're probably not going to get it until like late in the game, but that is really, really cool. I think that's awesome. Wow. It's cool. Really cool artwork, too, if I haven't mentioned that already. That's really cool. Okay, so lots of really cool magic items it's looking like here. Very, very, very nice. What is this? Whoa, teeth? So we have an artifact called the Teeth of Devalinar. Their stories given form. They're a collection of teeth, each suggestive of wildly different origins and made from various materials. Where the teeth fall, they bring legends to life. Oh, it summons different things. Oh, it looks like it looks like it basically it's like summons companions to help you. So you sow the teeth in the ground. And it like summons different companions that would adventure with you and help you. A pit fiend. Whoa, dude, you can get a pit fiend. Dang, that's really cool. Wow, I like that. I mean, it's an artifact. You're going to get that at like high level, level 17 or 20 or something. You know, that's pretty cool, though. Very, very cool. OK, so we have gone through the entire book. This is this is kind of like, you know, what's my final my final feeling on this? So, so, the new character options. Um, Artificer, very, very cool. All the different options that you get for all the existing classes, like barbarians, fighters, monks, and stuff, I feel like that's, there's lots of options there. I think those are very solid. I mean, I did, obviously haven't read through the details of every single one of them. I'm assuming that it's well-designed and that they're balanced and all that kind of stuff. But it sounds really cool. There's lots of lots of new options there for players. You basically have like 80 pages of new new options for existing classes and a new class, the Artificer. Well, kind of new. Um, the group patron system is very, very good. I cannot stress enough how awesome group patrons are. And that's included in this book. So that's really cool. Um, the spells, I think the summoning spells are very, very solid. Um, very, very cool addition to the game. I like those the magic items. I mean, I was just geeking out over the magic items. You saw you saw me geeking out over the magic items. So I think that's really solid. Um, then we get to the Dungeon Master tools. Um, the Session Zero stuff, I spent some time making fun of that. <laughs> 
Um, sidekicks, that looked good to me. I think the sidekick system looked really cool to me. Very promising. I'm probably going to use that in my games. Um, and then there was a lot of stuff about supernatural regions, magical phenomena that are a good way for a dungeon master to enhance their game. It gave you some ideas for that stuff to make your game a little bit more interesting um, flavor to it. Uh, cool locales and stuff. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. I think this is solid. I think this is really solid content. I think you get a lot of crap in here. Um, it seemed pretty good to me. The biggest thing that I'm going to come on in that I don't think I... Being able to change whatever you want about your race and all that stuff. Just flip things around however you want. I'm I am split on that as a player. I would love to be able to just assign my ability scores however I want <laughs> um, to be able to play whatever thing I want and make it just as powerful as if I had min maxed with the old rule set. Um, but it does it does homogenize everything and it does make everything less unique and less special because now it doesn't really matter what you are. Everything's kind of the same. We so I don't know how I feel about that. You know what I mean? Um, but that's that's like that's like my only little quibble with this. I think overall you're getting a very, very solid book. I I would say this to me feels better than Xanathar's even. Um, there's not a whole lot of things in Xanathar's that really excited me. This this feels m more solid than Xanathar's, in my personal opinion. There's only a couple of things in Xanathar's I even use. Well, no, there there yeah there are a few things there there are some really good things in Xanathar's. Anyway, that's not the point. I'm not I'm not comparing this to different product. It doesn't matter. Um, I like it. I wish the alternate cover didn't suck so bad. I mean, it's like it's just not it's it's probably the 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 least of the alternate covers. But do not judge a book by its cover, right? Because the contents of it are actually really good. So there we go. That is, yeah, you know, I haven't read like the PC options too much in Xanathar's. So I've mostly, I mostly use the random encounter tables and the downtime rules. Those are my favorite parts of Xanathar's. So, all right, folks, we are done. That is the live stream. We were literally just flipping through Tasha's to give you guys a peek at what's in there, give you some commentaries and stuff on it. Um, it does sound very solid to me. I would, I, I feel like I would recommend it to you, especially if you're a player, especially if you're a player, um, or if you're a dungeon master who's going to lend the book out to your players and stuff. Um, there, there isn't a whole lot in it for dungeon masters. There's some there 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 are the group patrons and the sidekicks. I feel like are the big things for dungeon masters. Um, good book though, lots of good content. So I'm I'm gonna go I'm gonna go now. <laughs>